The meeting will uh, please come to order. Today, the committee is holding a hearing on the State Department's single largest construction project in the world, the $600 million U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. This is the first oversight hearing Congress has held on this immense project. We will hear today from the State Department witnesses that the embassy will be built on time and under budget. I hope they're right. Billions of taxpayer dollars have been squandered on contracts in Iraq. There should be at least one major project that's done right. But there are red flags involving the embassy complex that should not be ignored. On July 5, the Washington Post ran a front page article that described quote, a cascade of building and safety blunders, end quote, in the facility being built to house the embassy security guards. This facility was built by the same company, First Kuwaiti, that is building the main embassy. It was delivered to the embassy with the assurance that it, quote, meets and exceeds contract requirements. It passed the inspections required by the State Department, and it seemed like a success. But when the kitchen equipment was turned on for the first time in May, the appliances didn't work, the electrical wiring melted, creating a serious fire hazard. Embassy officials cabled Washington, poor quality construction, life safety issues, inherent construction deficiencies, left the post with no recourse but to shut the camp down in spite of the blistering heat in Baghdad. Over two months later, the base for the guards remains shuttered. As we will learn today, there are other red flags. The oversight and management of the embassy project appears to be in disarray. The State Department agency responsible for the day-to-day -day oversight of the project is the Office of Overseas Building Operations, or OBO. But the OBO appears to be in a raging battle with the State Department officials in Baghdad who will ultimately live and work in the new embassy. The conflicts are so severe that the senior OBO official who is supposed to be on the ground in Iraq monitoring the construction of the new embassy has been banished from the country. It does not help matters that there are only three career State Department officials on site to oversee this massive project. Everyone else is a private contractor. The project has also been beset by allegations that the prime contractor, First Kuwaiti, has used forced labor to build the embassy, violating the laws against human trafficking and sending exactly the wrong message to Iraqis and the rest of the world about U.S. respect for human rights. This committee called this hearing to investigate these allegations. As the principal oversight committee in the House, that's our job. Unfortunately, the State Department has taken exactly the wrong approach to our inquiry. The Department has gone into full bunker mentality, stonewalling the committee's document requests and obstructing our efforts to conduct legitimate oversight of the embassy project. The committee sent a letter on July 10 requesting documents in pre preparation for today's hearing. We asked for a list of eight discrete, clearly identified memos reports, and cables. We also asked for a set of broader documents, including communications, briefings, and meeting minutes. We informed the Department that we wanted the eight documents we specifically identified before today's hearing. The rest could be produced afterwards. In response, the committee was told almost daily that these documents were on the way. We were told they are being gathered, they are being reviewed, they are in the approval process. They'll be here tomorrow. But aside from two incomplete cables, none of the documents were provided. Finally, two weeks after we requested these eight documents, we issued a subpoena for the documents. The due date was yesterday at 4 p.m. The department produced none of the documents by the deadline. Just this morning, the State Department faxed over a handful of documents that were required under the subpoena some of these documents raise even new questions. In one email exchange, the senior coordinator of the State Department's Office to Monitor and Combat Traffic in, Trafficking in Persons write that he has, quote, strong concerns about allegations of human trafficking among state contractors in Iraq. 
the State Department official in charge of overseeing the embassy project instructs his staff, do not respond to these folks. As you can see, no matter what you say, you cannot win, end quote. The fact that the Department is resisting congressional oversight doesn't mean that the project is failing, but it inspires no confidence in the Department's assertions that everything is on track. We have also received limited cooperation from the State Department's prime con contractor on this project, First Kuwaiti. We sent an invitation to company officials to testify here today, but they refused. We asked to review knowledgeable first Kuwaiti officials, but they refused. We asked for a telephone call to ask questions, but again they refused. First Kuwaiti did make a substantial document production to the committee and did provide a written statement, but from the standpoint of the U.S. taxpayer, its refusal to testify is to me another red flag. The State Department awarded First Kuwaiti a contract to build the largest U.S. embassy in the world. The company is being paid a half a billion dollars in taxpayers' funds, yet it is acting as if it is unaccountable to Congress and the taxpayer. There is one party in this process that did cooperate with the committee, and that is KBR. KBR has provided the documents we asked for, gave a, a briefing to committee staff, and agreed to testify here today. And when they took these steps, even though they knew that I have been an outspoken uh, about my concerns about other KBR projects in Iraq, despite the obstacles we faced, today's hearing will raise important questions about the embassy project. Witnesses will describe evidence of substantial labor conditions and shoddy construction work. Internal cables will reveal a department at war with itself. My goal is to use this hearing to begin to sort through the claims and counterclaims that envelop the embassy project. We won't answer every question that has emerged about this secretive project, but if we can shed more light on some, we'll be doing our job. I hope the embassy project opens on time and under budget, but real questions about the project are being raised and these need to be addressed. This is an unusual hearing in that it is being held as a joint hearing of the full committee and its national security subcommittee. The hearing is being held jointly in recognition of the extensive work that the subcommittee has been doing for the past several months to examine the allegations of human trafficking by First Kuwaiti. For this reason, after Ranking Member Davis is recognized for his statement, Subcommittee Chairman Tierney and Subcommittee Ranking Member Shays will, will be recognized for the opening statements, and then we will go uh, directly to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in my opinion, this could have been a good hearing. It could have been a thoughtful examination of how the State Department's Overseas Building Operations Office constructs diplomatic facilities under difficult conditions in some of the most inhospitable parts of the world. And it could be a responsible assessment of incidental and systematic problems encountered by an ambitious program to build more secure embassies particularly the effort to complete the state's largest single project ever in Baghdad, Iraq, in the middle of a war zone. It could, but I'm afraid it won't. Why? Because, as I think the Chairman will acknowledge, this hearing is a little bit premature. Based on media reports alone, the Committee scheduled today's testimony before completing a thorough investigation of thinly sourced, sensationalized charges of shoddy construction and labor abuses. And what has become an unfortunate modus operandi? Uh, the a politically charged allegations are marching miles ahead of the proven facts. Whenever a news story jumps to a convenient conclusion about suspe suspected administration malfeasance or misconduct, the committee rushes to see how they can elevate mere questions, concerns, and speculation before the real fact finding. As I've said before, it's oversight by firing squad. Ready, fire, aim. The most significant waste, fraud, and abuses we're likely to uncover today may, may be our own. So what are we really aiming at today? The allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse at the new uh, U.S. Embassy in Iraq cited in today's hearing title are based primarily on an exchange of State Department cables detailing a dispute over an entirely separate construction project, the security camp adjacent to the embassy, a completely separate contract. Both projects were built by the same contractor, First Kuwaiti General Trading and Contracting. But the camp was designed as a temporary collection of prefabricated trailers and support structures 
while the $592 million embassy compound involved full-scale construction of permanent buildings. In the short time we've had to pursue claims of substandard materials and practices, we found nothing to suggest the intramural spat over who's responsible for expanding and changing design elements at the temporary camp has any implications whatsoever on the quality of work at the permanent embassy. But here's a fact that does have an impact on the risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. Both projects were built under firm, fixed-price contracts, the kind the majority generally prefers. First Kuwaiti got to work only after no U.S. contractor offered to meet the ambitious 24-month schedule while facing substantial financial and logistical risks, building in a war zone on those terms. They wanted a cost reimbursement arrangement. Under the fixed price vehicle, disputes over electrical wiring loads and dripping pipes can have little impact on ultimate cost. In effect, we're here litigating a punch list, the usual inventory of fixes and finishing touches generated by any project this size. Allegations about labor abuses and human trafficking violations are far more serious, and it appears the State Department took them seriously. We can be proud of U.S. labor protections, but shouldn't be naive about the applications elsewhere in the world. Nevertheless, complaints about working and living conditions were referred to the State Department Inspector General, who, in conjunction with the IG for the Multinational Forces, Iraq, conducted on-site inspection and interviews with foreign workers and U.S. personnel. The State IG team found, quote, nothing that caused us to believe that traffic and in person violations had occurred at the site, unquote. The military IG did find illegal and deceptive hiring practices by recruiting agencies, but he found no evidence of the alleged abduction, abuse, overcrowding, or unsanitary facilities. In fact, the MF, uh, MNF IG concluded of the 58 living areas inspected, the State Department facility, quote, rated in the top third with above average quality of life conditions, unquote. Against those findings, we have claims by disgruntled ex-employees who may have pending or potential financial interests against the government. Their accusations should be evaluated very carefully, something we have not had the opportunity to do. They may sound atrocious. Someone saw passports in a safe or boarding passes marked Dubai on a flight to Iraq. <coughs> but today we'll get one side of the story. Only further inquiry will tell us if the passports were stored voluntarily or whether anyone boarding a charter flight in Kuwait was confused about its destination. Another reason not to take these allegations at face value is that they've been thrown at an extraordinarily effective federal agency. Under the leadership of General Charles Williams, State Bureau of Overseas Building Operations has completed 47, 47 new secured diplomatic facilities in six years, on schedule and all within budget. He brings unimpeachable credentials to a difficult job coming out of retirement at the request of his friend Colin Powell. After logging 2,000 flight hours in helicopters in Vietnam, General Williams finished a 29-year Army military career successfully completing major construction projects with the Corps of Engineers. He knows how to build. He's proven his dedication, his skill, and his integrity. I question whether we'll prove anything else here today. Nevertheless, I thank the witnesses for their time and perspectives. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Tierney, Chairman of the Subcommittee. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Davis for allowing the National Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee to jointly hold this hearing. Uh, there are many questions raised by the construction of this enormous 65-acre, 24-building walled fortress of an embassy in Iraq. What will it mean to Iraqis? Will most Iraqis react like one quoted recently in the Los Angeles Times article who said, they're not leaving Iraq for a long time and he called the embassy a symbol of oppression and injustice. What purpose does an embassy serve if nearly 1,000 of the United States or the State Department officials are only rarely permitted to interact with Iraqis outside the Green Zone? An essential part of their job is questioned by the American Foreign Service Association, the professional body representing State Department employees. What does it mean that our military is planning on co-locating at the embassy site, and how will this be interpreted? Is this reminiscent of the even larger Somalia compound that was dismantled by looters after the overthrow of the dictator Mohammed Siad Bari? And does it foretell the planned Lebanon embassy now said to be located in the heart of Hezbollah-controlled territory? Is it bigger than it should be if you really expect Iraq to stabilize, and not as big as it needs to be, the nerve center of an ongoing war effort, as the LA Times quotes a State Department advisor and Council on Foreign Relations senior fellow as saying. But the purpose of our hearing today is to look at the construction of the embassy itself. Our new Iraq embassy is not only our most expensive embassy to date, it is also supposed to become a beacon of freedom and democracy in Iraq and throughout the Middle East. 
Still, as Chairman Waxman has noted, very troubling allegations have come to the subcommittee's attention that this proposed beacon of freedom was built, quite literally, on the backs of workers from Nepal, the Philippines, Pakistan, India, and Ghana, just to name a few nations. We have heard allegations that some third country nationals working for the prime contractor First Kuwaiti had to pay recruitment fees amounting to more than a full year's salary, fees as high as $3,000 with salaries as low as $7 a day. We have heard of workers essentially waylaid to Iraq, being told they were going to work in Dubai and giving boarding passes to Dubai, but being transported instead to Iraq. We have heard of verbal abuse, physical assaults and intimidation, the first Kuwaiti managers brandishing weapons. We have heard of workers living a dozen or two dozen or even more in a single trailer measuring 40 feet by 10 feet. That would essentially be the, the breadth of this uh, two rows of seats and about the width as well. We have heard of inadequate medical care, of a lack of safety training and equipment, and about deaths not adequately explained. And we have heard of workers unable to return home, whether because their passports were withheld or because of threats or because they faced a year's salary penalty if they are resigned. And I might note that the withholding of passports by employers is an act forbidden uh, by the, the United States government. Our first panel today consists of former workers from the embassy site who will tell us what they themselves have heard and saw. We take these allegations very seriously. Unfortunately, however, it appears that not everyone may have done so. We have learned during the course of our investigation that a number of officials in our own State Department may have looked the other way when confronted with these disturbing or inconvenient allegations. Our State Department is supposed to be the face of U.S. diplomacy to the world. Unfortunately, it appears that when it came to the workers used to construct our flagship embassy in Iraq, some State Department officials may not have kept their eyes wide open. For example, it has become clearer and clearer that little to no forethought on labor issues have been done during the contract award and in the vetting of First Kuwait. It appears the State Department officials have largely taken a hands-off approach with respect to First Kuwaiti's relations with its third country workers. And we've heard about the State Department's own office to combat human trafficking, pressing for action from General Williams and from other top officials in the Bureau of Overseas Building Operations and from the State Department Inspector General and receiving what can only be described as the cold shoulder. We have a State Department Inspector General who reportedly allowed First Kuwaiti itself to select the workers to be interviewed, an Inspector General who apparently didn't even interview those alleging abuses, and an Inspector General who didn't use interpreters despite the fact that only 10 percent of the worker population was fluent in English. I sincerely hope that what we hear today from our State Department witnesses dispels and explains those troubling stories our investigation has uncovered. I hope we hear that a strict adherence to on time and on budget does not mean the trampling of workers' rights and dignity. It is important that all of us in the United States government recognize that our words and our actions matter. Our words and our actions matter both because others in the world are watching us and listening to us, but even more importantly because they reflect on who we are and who we should constantly be striving to become. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Shea. Mr. Chairman, when it comes to United States citizens and foreign nationals working in our embassies abroad, there is absolutely no question that their safety and security must be our top priority. And we also have the significant responsibility to examine alleged waste, abuse, and fraud in government. We need to look at the State Department and its contractors in the construction of the new $600 million U.S. dollar embassy in Baghdad. I support today's oversight efforts. Unfortunately, we have today, what we have today is potentially a one-sided discussion of allegations found in some recent articles and Internet blog entries. In terms of preparation and research, the minority staff have been rushed through more than a half dozen interviews this week, many of which they were given just five minutes' notice of, and as of last night, the committee still had not received key documents from the Department of State. So although the facts are still muddled, this is what we do know. A recent construction guard camp near to but separate from the Baghdad Embassy is running on schedule. It appears there were some electrical problems, but it is still not clear whether it was these problems that resulted in a temporary delay in the occupation of the camp or other construction and installation deficiencies. And on the, uh, on the one hand, we hear from the Department of State the project is currently on schedule and within budget. 
on the other hand we hear from contractors and whistleblowers that the construction is suffering massive problems with the fuel tanks sprinklers air conditioning heating and electric electrical system among other things in reality this is a complex high risk project in a war zone so certainly there will be some issues with the building system but we still lack are still lacking hard evidence to make any assessments the other side today's hearings is allegations of potential human trafficking and labor abuses. We cannot take lightly these allegations of human trafficking and labor abuses. Human trafficking is modern day slavery and something that affects every nation on every continent around the globe, including the United States, and we must put an end to it wherever we find it. In 2000, my fellow members and I drew a line when we passed the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, making human trafficking a federal crime and between 2001 and 2006, the Department of Justice has prosecuted over 360 defendants, secured 238 convictions and guilty pleas, and had, had opened 639 new human trafficking investigations. That is how seriously the United States takes this issue. So it makes sense that when individuals, some of whom are here today with us, raise concerns about possible labor abuses or inhumane conditions, the Trafficking in Persons Office in the Department of State and the Inspector Generals uh, from the multinational force Iraq quickly took action, observing the employees, interviewing workers, and expecting facilities on the site in Baghdad. In fact, the state MF1 uh, Inspector Generals, Iraqi MFN Iraq Inspector Generals, in their three reviews did not find anything to indicate human trafficking violations had occurred. However, serious questions about possible illegal and deceptive hiring practice by recruiting agencies are still being pursued. And it is reported the Department of Justice has recently opened their own human trafficking investigation to pursue these allegations. I commend each of these agencies for taking this matter seriously and continuing with their investigation. I look forward to today's hearing, but wish we had more information and had spent more time preparing this inve investigation before commencing this hearing. Nevertheless, I do appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and thank each of the witnesses for providing their testimony for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shays. I want to now call forward our first uh, witness, Mr. Carl Deming. He's the engineer and construction manager of KBR. Mr. Deming, we're pleased to have you with us uh, today to, um, to testify and to give us your analysis of what's been happening. It's the policy of this committee that all witnesses that testify uh, take an oath, so I'd like to ask you if you would to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate that you did answer in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Deming, your uh, prepared statement is going to be in the record in its entirety. What I'd like to ask you to do is to give your testimony. We, we do try to keep the testimony, oral testimony, to around five minutes. I'm going to have a clock, and uh, it'll turn, it'll be green, but then it'll turn uh, orange when it indicates you have a minute left, and then red when the time is up. Uh, if you feel you need to go over to summarize, that's fine but uh, we do want all witnesses to try to keep within the time frame so we can hear from everybody. But yeah, we're ha happy to have you, have you here. There's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pushed in so it's activated. You've done that, and I want to recognize you to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Carl Deming. I am currently employed as a technical professional leader of specialties for KBR in Baghdad in support of USMI, the U.S. mission in Iraq. Under the log cab contract, I oversee KBR's engineering and construction work in Iraq. I arrived in country soon after the invasion in 2003. I have been on the ground there ever since. I am a participating electrician, practicing, and have been a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers for more than 30 years. You asked KBR to assist the committee in its inquiry regarding the Baghdad Embassy Security Force Guard Camp, and I am here to do so. The guard camp and the new embassy are being constructed by another contractor. KBR did not design or construct either one. Once the guard camp is complete, KBR will provide support services to the personnel who will be housed there. I am a native Californian. I grew up in Burbank, went to Burbank High, and later the Los Angeles Trade Technical School. 
I joined the U.S. Army in 1971 and returned to Burbank after my tour of duty. I began work in the electrical field in 1975 and in the course of my career have had the opportunity to work in many aspects of this field. For example, power generation for the Federal Aviation Administration and the Marine Corps, electrical systems and construction positions for International Controls, Carnation, Lockheed, and Anheuser-Busch. I have held State of California electrical, HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, contractor's licenses, and an LA City supervisor's license. I also owned and operated my own electrical firm. I worked on a wide variety of projects where the IBEW supplied the work teams. I was a member of the National Guard from 1975 through 1997, and I volunteered for the Gulf War and served in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait as a staff sergeant with the Guard. I moved to Denver soon after leaving active duty, I worked on multiple construction projects at Denver International Airport. At night, I also taught the IBEW's electrical apprenticeship program. I began working for KBR in May 2003. After an initial assignment in Basra, I began working in Baghdad on several power generation projects related to the U.S. Embassy Annex. In November of 2006, I was promoted to my current position. Under the log cap contract, KBR provides a variety of support functions to the U.S. and coalition personnel in Iraq and Afghanistan. As part of that work, every day KBR provides meals, laundry, and other support services throughout theater. Specific to today's discussion, KBR was asked to prepare to provide similar services at the Baghdad Embassy Security Force Camp. As I mentioned before, KBR did not design or construct either the guard camp or the new embassy compound. But has the company prepared to support personnel at the guard camp, KBR participated in several site visits and was asked to conduct a technical inspection of the facilities. This is not unlike having an inspection done before buying a house. My team and I carried out these inspections and earlier this, and earlier this week, committee's request, I brief the committee's bipartisan staff on our findings. I am here today to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I, I have questions and I know other members will as well. We're going to proceed to uh, recognize members five minutes at a time. Uh, the Iraq Embassy is the largest construction project at the State Department. It has a price tag of $600 million and its successful completion is an essential part of the administration's strategy for Iraq. The first part of this mammoth project is to, com uh, to be completed was a base for the security guards. It was delivered to the embassy this spring by the prime contractor, First Kuwaiti, with the assurance that it meets and exceeds contract requirements. My understanding is that KBR was hired by the State Department to run the guard base and prepare meals for the guards. As a result, KBR entered the facility after it was turned over to the embassy to see how the equipment was operating. Mr. Deming, uh, I want to ask you about the problems KBR found in the construction of the guard base when you tested the facility. I understand you were part of a KBR team that was involved with the process of starting up the dining facility in the guard camp after the first Kuwaiti finished assembling it. Is that right? That's correct, Mr. Uh, Chairman. On May 25th, the Embassy sent a cable back to Washington to the Overseas Business Operations Office, or OBO, that describes some of the problems you encountered with the process. I'd like to make this cable part of the record today, and without objection, that'll be the order. Paragraph 3 of the Embassy cable says that on May 14th, KBR was in the process of initiating the dining facility when the wires began to melt. Is that right? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Paragraph 4 of the cable states that some of the appliances were not working properly and there was a burning smell. It also says that the staff received electrical shocks. In your opinion, was this a serious safety issue and why? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it was a serious safety issue. Uh, I'll e explain why as layman as I possibly can. The, um, the grounding issues and the personnel injury uh, as far as coming in contact with any of the metal equipment such as being commercial type um, cooking equipment and such in the facility as well as the type of facility it is. They are trailers or modular units and they are steel or metal of construction. Okay. 
in, in, um, at that point, the cable says you had shut off all the equipment and could not serve any meals. Paragraph 7 of the embassy cable states, the initial assessment by the KBR electricians was that the gauge of the electrical wiring is too small for the electrical load required and that most, if not all, of the wiring will need to be replaced. It then says, a follow-on inspection by KBR identified additional electrical issues that required corrective action. Can you tell us more about the problems you found? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Um, in regards to the electrical cable, the equipment that this cable was feeding, we call them circuits, and they're protected by overcurrent devices. Uh, the system does not work properly if it's not designed properly. Uh, we did not have the design drawings or plans at that time, so we were merely there to assist in uh, starting this facility up so we can f serve the first meal on the four 15th of May. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, these issues arose, and uh, we did have personnel that were getting shocked or electrocuted mildly at the facility. We did shut the power off to investigate and assist the uh, contractor overseas building office to find these issues and try to remedy them. Well, the cable uh, mentions problems with the grounding, electrical feed, split wiring, wiring not contained in junction boxes. Paragraph 11 of the embassy cable states that on May 24, 10 days after the meltdown, OBO said the wiring had been corrected. You came back on May 25th the next day, but you still found continuing concerns with the wiring according to the cable. How can it be that OBO thought it had fixed the problems when it really hadn't? Mr. Chairman, we don't monitor what what those th that entity does out there on that camp. Uh, we are directed by our client at that time would be the U.S. Army to perform these tasks, and only under direction do we actually act. Well, the wiring failed once. First, Kuwaiti fixed it, and OBO checked it, but there were still problems. And if what you are telling us is right, something appears to be seriously wrong with the management and oversight of this project. This doesn't mean that the rest of the embassy project will be plagued by similar problems, but it obviously raises a major red flag. The State Department said the guard base was fine, that it met and exceeded requirements, but it turned out to be a fiasco. The $600 million question is whether we are going to discover the same kinds of problems when the embassy is turned over to the State Department this fall. Um, I want to recognize Mr. Shays for five minutes as well. Um, Mr. Deming, first, uh, you uh, deserve a tremendous thanks for serving your country by serving overseas in Iraq for so long uh, in your capacity um, with KBR, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Congressman. Um, what I want to do is just be clear. We're not talking about the $600 million embassy. We're talking about a temporary camp uh, designed to house workers who would work on the $600 million uh, embassy. Is that correct? To my understanding, Mr. Congressman, that uh, BESF was the Baghdad uh, Security Force camp. Um, this would be. Is the answer yes? For the security force. What you're talking about now is a facility that is temporary, designed to hold the security forces or the workers or whatever, correct? Correct. Okay, we're not talking about a permanent embassy uh, problem, correct? Uh, this, this does not attach to the right. bi big embassy campus itself. Okay. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that we, sh we should have problems in a temporary facility, but I want us to, to make sure we're not mixing the two right yet. Um, now, it's my understanding that the uh, OBM, oh, the, the oversight building, uh, um, overseas building operations uh, is a State Department uh, um, agency that is, uh, had basically uh, written out the specs for this temporary facility. Uh, and that when KBR got there, they felt that the facility was not adequate. Uh, is that not true?
that would take some explanation, Mr. Congressman. Well, first off, isn't it uh, true that that this was a facility that was built according to the specs of the State Department, and when KBR got there, they said this isn't uh, going to be able to handle all that we need. Isn't that true? Do, uh, can I explain well, to that? Well, first off, tell me if it's true or not, and then explain. That is true. Okay, now explain. Okay, what, what the, the issues were when KBR was asked to perform um, operation and maintenance and logistics services at the guard camp itself, we have certain equipment and support um, mechanics that require trucks, um, fire trucks, uh, fuel trucks, and et cetera. At that time, we did not have a lot of information. Yeah, I need a shorter version. The, the bottom well, line is that, that are you trying to say that they should have known that it was not going to be adequate? No, sir. We could not get our equipment in there to perform that O&M. That, that was our pushback. Okay. Um, are you a witness today to uh, have evidence about uh, the embassy itself and that the embassy itself has major uh, construction problems? No, Mr. Congressman. Okay. So your, 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 your thrust today is just to say there may be an uh, indication of some problems with the full embassy because there's problems with this temporary site? Or are you just here because you were requested to be here? What's your motivation for being here? I was requested to be here, uh, or asked to be here, Mr. Right. Congressman, to explain the difficulties and issues at the uh, security Temporary force state. camp. Okay. Um, in your uh, work uh, in the United States, is this uh, sometimes uh, what is built sometimes doesn't meet the need of the person of the client? Is this unusual, uh, or is this uh, is this event unusual? What what you're encountering? what you encountered in Iraq. The, the comparing to Iraq, it's a very uh, volatile environment. Uh, yes. Unusual, I would say no, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'd be happy to yield to my colleague. Is, is the problem here with the specs, or is the problem with the construction? Uh, Mr. Congressman, KBR was never privy to the specifications that this, this entity was built by. Um, we were going by the United States National Electrical Codes and some of the uh, national building codes, the UBC and the UMC. So you don't have any information that the construction didn't meet the specs and there might have been a problem with the specs? That's correct. And you don't have any information that there is anything wrong in the construction at the embassy at all, do you? That's correct. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Deming, for being with us today. And um, do I, did I understand you correctly when you said that you are an electrician? That's correct, Mr. Congressman. And, and how long have you been that? Over 30 years, Mr. Congressman. Now, Mr. Deming, I understand that after the wires melted at the guard camp, is that true? They melted? Yes, sir, Mr. Congressman. All right, let me see if we can connect some dots here. The embassy asked, after they melted, the embassy asked KBR to conduct a technical inspection of the entire guard camp electrical system. Uh, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, were you a part of that in, in, in any way? Yes, I was, Mr. Congressman. All right. Now, Mr. Chairman, I have a copy of KBR's report dated May 25th, 2007, uh, which I asked to be made a part of the hearing record. Um, Mr. Deming, this report says that it is from Paul uh, Creation. Creation, you know him? I'm say, say that again. I'm Mr. probably pronouncing his wor wor name wrong. Paul, C-H-R-E-T-I-E-N. Creighton. Yeah, who is he? He's my electrical engineer. He works on my staff. All right, so he works, he's under you? That is correct, Mr. Congressman. All right. On page one of this report, it lists areas, quote, areas of concern, and it says this, quote, one of the greatest areas of concern is the use of counterfeit, counterfeit wire, uh, unquote, which refers to a wire found which has a particular wire size printed on the insulation, but actually has smaller, lower capacity conductors. Is that right? That's correct, Mr. Congressman. Did you actually obtain samples of the counterfeit wire? Yes, that is correct, Mr. Now, Congressman. that word counterfeit, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Yes, it is. And in other words, it, it implies that somebody 
did something wrong. Is that right? In other words, that they that is not proper. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and how did you determine what the size of the wire and the insulation was? When the uh, team was inspecting on that on that technical inspection uh, through the panels to further meet the needs of the direction that we received, they identify that first by looking at the cable that was installed. Mm -hmm. um, further investigation, we found that the cable was marked and on that cable marking, it was marked for the required cable size. As further investigation went, the uh, copper diameter size of the conductors inside the multi-conductor cable was sought to be smaller than what the, s the stamped rating was on the jacket. So in, in other words, I even if the specifications had asked for a certain thing, when you went to look at the wire that even if the specifications had asked for it, the proper wire was not there. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I believe we have a picture of the counterfeit wires uh, you found. Can we please uh, display that on the screen? And uh, where did you find where did you find this wire in the camp? This cable was at this particular cable was going to the fryers from a panel inside the DFAC, the dining facility. And so, what problems might result from the use of such a counterfeit wire? Well, they might melt. As they did? Correct. After, after you did your report to the embassy, the embassy wrote this cable to OBO, and here's what they said, and I quote, several additional issues have arisen, including the discovery of counterfeit wire, end of quote. So they reported what you found to Washington. Now, I want to show you what Washington said in response. Uh, this was written on June 7th, and I asked that it be entered into the record. The cable said this, quote, we have also asked KBR and Post to identify any counterfeit wire in this location, and they have not been able to do so. Mr. Deming, first of all, did you understand my question, what I just said? Yes, Mr. Congressman. And I'm asking you, Mr. Deming, did anyone at OBO ever ask you about the counterfeit wire you found? No, Mr. Congressman. Did anyone at OBO ask anyone on your team about it? Uh, Mr. Congressman. To your knowledge? Uh, to my knowledge, no. Do you know why OBO would claim in this cable that they asked you for this when they didn't? Do you know? No, I do not know that. One of the documents that the committee subpoenaed is a fire safety inspection report at the embassy complex itself. We understand that this inspection report documents a number of serious safety risks similar to those that KBR found at the guard base. But the State Department won't turn this document over to the committee. That's not a good sign. Covering up serious safety problems at the embassy does not make them go away. Uh, again, this word counterfeit is very significant, is it not? That is correct, Mr. Congressman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Davis? Yeah. Um, did you ever, sh did you ever, um, you, you showed the cable, this uh, counterfeit cable, whatever, to the embassy post, is that right? That's correct, Mr. Congressman. I mean, there is a, an inherent conflict sometimes between the Embassy Post and OBO in terms of what the spec should be. Uh, everybody, they, they always are asking for to try to get greater capacity, better walls, better flooring. Uh, in my experience, that's been true. They just they always want a little more in the State Department to put these things on time and under budget uh, has uh, certain specs. Do you have any evidence that this wire did not meet the specs? No, Mr. Congressman, okay. I've never I seen think this that, I think that's the nub of the matter. I think what we have here is that if you looked at American standards in a permanent facility, you would have looked for a different kind of wiring that would have supported uh, what you were trying to put in. This was a temporary facility. The specs that were written uh, were one thing, and uh, maybe they should have been something else. I'm just, I'm not an expert in this area. But uh, what I'm looking for is evidence that the construction here was in fact counterfeit, which would mean they represented it would be one thing and it was something else versus what the specifications called for. And since this was a temporary facility, I don't know what the specs called for, and we can ask this in our next panel. You don't know what the specs called for, do you? No, Thank Mr. Congressman, I do I'm not. That's I mean, I think that's the point we're trying to get at is, is they've made a leap over here without looking at the underlying specifications in the contract. Uh, this was a temporary facility. 
uh, they ha had a budget and it, it, you know, do you have any evidence that this would not have met the, uh, well, let me just ask this. What capacity did the customer acquire for its dining facility, do you know? How many people they were trying to feed there? There's 1,200 personnel that were to uh, live on that guard camp and they serve three meals a day. Uh, what organization is KBR's customer uh, for the O&M contract to operate the guard camp? Could you repeat that, Mr. Connor? What organization is your customer uh, for the o on the O&M contract to operate the guard camp? Who are you working for? The U.S. Army. Okay, so your contract was with the U.S. Army, and this was a State Department facility. That's correct, Mr. Okay. Congressman. Now, what capacity does that customer require for its dining facility? Capacity as in personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 1,200 personnel. Okay. Is that capacity different from the capacity the dining facility was built to support? I do not believe so, Mr. Congressman. Okay. Some have said that the reason for the problems with the wiring in the dining facility was caused by KBR installing more equipment than the facility was designed to accept. Now, what's your view on that? Uh, that's not true. Okay. Uh, but you haven't seen the specs? Have not seen the specifications, Mr. Congressman, but most of the kitchen equipment, the commercial type of kitchen equipment, was already installed, not by KBR. Right. Now, OBO says that they repaired the damage soon after and that the wiring issue was resolved. Is that correct? Those were the readily identified issues on May 14th that they resolved. So they resolved those issues? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Pretty, pretty quickly? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Um, is the dining facility that you inspected capable of handling the capacity required by your customer? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Okay. Um, what improvements need to be made to the dining facility in order to meet your, your customer's capacity requirements or are they already done? In our contract and according to preventative med issues and some of the Army regulations were required certain uh, things to happen as far as uh, how hot the water must be, how much water we must have to properly sanitize and wash the dishes. The food storage uh, were required in some instances to maintain several days of storage because of the environment that we're in. And uh, in situations like that, Mr. Congressman, are required that we brought to the attention that facility did not meet. Did you have concerns about your contractual liability for the dining facilities uh, during the contract for the camp? Uh, just when we were asked to do the O&M services is when we brought up those concerns. Do you know if KBR submitted an offer to build the embassy compound? No, I do not know that, no, Mr. No, Congressman. No. But once again, just to clarify, you have no knowledge or no relationship between what was done uh, at the embassy itself versus this separate contract. Uh, uh, in the, in for, uh, for, the, for the tents and the dining facility, is that correct? That's correct, Temporary Mr. Facility. Congressman. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Watson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Denny, for being here. Uh, in the OBO's cable responding to the embassy's concerns, they essentially blame you at KBR for all of these problems. And I'd like to have you respond to some of the statements. Uh, the basic argument seems to be that after the camp was turned over, KBR came in and added a lot of extra equipment that was never intended to be there. So let me read you what the OBO's cable actually says, and it's in paragraph three. It says, this was a problem created solely by POST and KBR by putting additional equipment in the facility and not checking the electrical loads. And the cable also says, all such equipment appear to be larger, higher power requirement. The, the manufactured uh, manufacturer had intended based on our original specifications this is the real reason for the facility overheating. So what is your response to that claim? Um, Ms. Congresswoman, we did not 
provide any extra equipment to the kitchen facility other than the uh, a 20 foot by eight foot container for a chiller or cooler unit, which was placed outside the dining facility and wired to a separate circuit system, as well as a 20 by uh, eight foot container uh, utilized as a freezer container. And those two items were uh, brought over from the previous camp where the guards are living now, Camp Jackson, in order to store food there in preparation to move the guards over to the new camp and provide defect services by May 15th. Can you stipulate to that the equipment that you brought in and the reason? Yes, ma'am. The equipment that we brought in was specifically for the additional food that was required and to start the defect services on May 15th. Is there a work order that would state that in writing? Was there a work order? Um, there was some, I bl there would have to have been a work order for us to do that, uh, Ms. Congresswoman. And on the email traffic, I just been handed from First Kuwaiti on one of their uh, preparations for a billing statement. They do include adding an existing chiller to be moved from the Triple Canopy Camp and add existing freezer to be moved from the Triple Canopy Camp. Uh, they were aware that these two items needed to be brought over and, and in working condition in order to meet the May 15th uh, inaugural meal. Okay, did you also check the electrical loads? We were um, asked to do the technical inspection after we received the um, administrative contracting letter to do the O&M on the camp. And upon that inspection is when we started to find some of the issues on the loads. However, it was not not until the actual startup of the facility is when the events appeared. And did you document that inspection? Can we find it somewhere in writing? Yes, ma'am. What ma you found? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now here's another statement that was in the cable. Now I'm just repeating what the cable said. Uh, KBR confirmed and agreed specifically that they could manage and operate the facility based on the design. Is that true? I'm sorry, Ms. Congresswoman, can you uh, say that I'll again? I'll repeat it, yes. KBR, you, confirmed and agreed specifically that they could manage and operate the facility based on the design. Did you know what the design was? No, Ms. Congresswoman, I, uh, I, <coughs> I really can't answer that. That might have been something from upper management, but to my knowledge, um, we did not accept that based on design. So there was no confirmation? That's correct. From you, okay. From me. Now here's another statement. KBR created the problems, okay, and are now trying to put this matter on the construction of the camp. And uh, this says that KBR created the problems. What's your response to that? That's not true, Ms. Congresswoman. Okay, and you stipulate to that you're under oath. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The cable not only blames KBR for the problems, but also suggests a motive. And this is what was said in the cable. May it's I have it's this? Just finish up if you would, please. Thank you. Okay, I'll go real quickly. These items do not represent any health or safety risk as outlined in the 25 May cable and will not stop post from occupying the camp if they desire. For whatever reason, it appears post and KBR simply do not want to operate the camp for other reasons which have nothing to do with the construction or equipment installed as part of the original scope. Do you have any idea what's being said here, and does KB, uh, KBR have other reasons for not wanting to operate this camp? 
No, Ms. Congresswoman, I, I do not understand the uh, justification of that statement. Um, however, if I may, I'd like to, your question about the safety of the camp. On May 15th, I received an email from my electrical superintendent working out there describing how our guys have gotten shocked touching up against the frame of the trailer. None of our wiring was powered up at the time of the modifications that we were doing over there for the May 15th meal. So they shut down the breakers one by one to find the cause. One of the feeds for the oven had actually melted. This was a feeder wire to the ovens. Uh, equipment KBR did not supply. The uh, actually melted and came into contact with the trailer causing personnel in there to get shocked or electrocuted. It did not trip the circuit breaker, the overcurrent protection, because it's improperly grounded. That's another safety issue that we discovered during the May 14th uh, startup. Um, this goes on, ma'am. Thank you. We can uh, cover okay, that maybe another time. I'll, I'll Thank continue you, to Lawson. probe this if we have a second round. Thank you very much. Mr. Westmoreland, you would recognize for five minutes. Thank you, and uh, thank you for coming to testify. Um, are you aware of any labor abuse that was involved? Uh, no, Mr. Congressman. And let me ask you another question. Uh, referring to some of these pictures uh, that submitted, I don't, are you familiar with the pictures that have been submitted? Yes, I am, Mr. Congressman. The last picture shows, um, um, and I don't know the exact term for it, but that shows the uh, measurement of the wires. That's correct. Uh, could you tell me what those numbers actually say on that picture? That's correct. On the top picture, uh, the micrometer reading is the cable that we buy, that we have had in stock from our purchases. The 3.9 is the diameter dimension of the copper wire inside that cable. It's a multi-conductor cable. And if you take the <coughs> diameter divided by 2 squared and do some mathematics, you get the area in millimeters of that cable, which comes to a little over 10 millimeters. That's referred to as a 10 millimeter square conductor or multi-conductor cable. The bottom picture shows the suspect counterfeit cable marked clearly 10 millimeter square with the micrometer gauge on that it's reading 2.8 and again if you do the mathematics Mr. Congressman the area square of that conductor will come out to 6 millimeter. That 6 millimeter difference is a significant amperage load difference on that cable of what it's capable of carrying. Thank you, and, and um, I noticed you got a calculator there next to it, so I'm assuming that you just can't do this in your mind. It takes some type of calculation to come up with these millimeters. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Congressman. How many electricians have you ever seen on the job that carried around one of these, uh, uh, whatever those things you, micrometers, micrometers were? with a calculator. Have you ever seen any electricians have those in their nail pouch or their uh, uh, screwdriver belt or anything? No, Mr. Congressman. Okay. Um, in some of the other pictures, I noticed, uh, and, and I'm in the building business, and, <clears throat> you know, um, I've never seen red, blue, and yellow wires. Uh, there seems to be some type of color coding uh, for these wires. What are the different colors? Why are some of the wires blue, some yellow, and some red? Mr. Congressman, that type of cabling and color coding is indigenous to that region. I'm sorry? That type of color coding and cabling is indigenous to that region. Okay, and so when I look at the panel box and I see uh, red, yellow, and blue that would be some kind of indication that somebody might have a language barrier or something, but he would know to plug the red wire into the red and the yellow into the yellow and the blue into the blue. Uh, typically, just like the United States, Mr. Congressman, we have black, red, uh, blue has a uh, indication of phasing. 
And this is the same configuration, uh, just they use different colors over there. And that would be considered um, what we say R, Y, B, which would be the same as black, red, blue. Well, I've been in the construction business a long time, seen a lot of panel boxes, and I've never seen any uh, that had the color codes uh, uh, for the cables to go into. But I understand that. So not only is there maybe something lost, uh, uh, I guess, in interpretation or in wiring diagrams or uh, differences in, in uh, you know, building codes or whatever, uh, but also the thickness of this wire would be something if you were using metric or American or whatever to try to get in place that this was only a six millimeter. And do you, do you know if by just cutting that wire with your hand that you would have uh, noticed any uh, difference? Mr. Congressman, I might be a little rusty on that after being in the, uh, the administrative portion of this industry for a while, but the gentlemen that are in the field and do this every day, it is very typical for them to distinguish the differences on site. Okay, and, and let me ask you another question. You mentioned the, uh, you, you mentioned the uh, ground wiring uh, to the um, boxes. Um, do you, do you have any, and, and I looked and I didn't really, s I couldn't tell, uh, you know, where the ground wire would, would go. I didn't see the bus bar, I guess, or whatever on the box itself. But how much would it cost to run a ground wire and uh, hook it to these panels? I mean, what, what's an estimate? I mean, are we talking about $10 million, a million dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, a thousand dollars? What would be the cost to uh, correct this grounding situation? And really, Mr. Uh, Swallow, the we're going to let him ask that answer that first question if we might, because uh, your time has expired. Okay. And I, and I do want to hear the answer, then we'll move on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Congressman. Uh, I could not give you a price on the cost of that because of the intricacy of the construction involved. The cable's already been run in some spots and areas of the camp. They've poured concrete roadways over, and this would have to be tallied up as where square footage. Well, Thank you very and, much. And just, to argue, just, just to follow up on that, just I for one question, just you know, one quick if thing. If you can keep it very, very, okay. very brief. Why would you have to run a ground wire under a road? I'm, I mean, I'm That's the way they that. ran the feeders, uh, Mr. Congressman. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lynch, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deming, for helping the committee with its work. Uh, j just, uh, I'm going to let this electrical uh, thing go at some point, but it would seem to me, I spent 20 years working, strapping on the work boots and working on a construction site uh, before coming to Congress and uh, know my way around a construction site. This is a pretty basic mistake here. This is basic. Either the people doing the work at the very basic level should have recognized what they would do. If they knew what they were doing, they would have known this was wrong. That's the, the workers themselves the workers themselves, wiring this job for the intended purpose, it should have been painfully obvious that they were making huge mistakes here. Then, if you go to the next level, the foreman or forewoman that are, over, that are supervising the actual work, they should have known. And then, of course, whoever was above them, the supervisors on the site, they should have known. And then, and then the quality control people who were supposed to be checking this work, they should have known. This is like putting your pants on backwards. This is something that should have been obvious to anybody who was familiar with, with electrical work. And uh, regardless of what country, what, regardless of what standard, this was just totally unacceptable. I mean, when you, when you turn the appliances on and the wires start to melt, you know, you, you, know, you get yourself a problem. Uh, so I, I think it, it, this is, this is something that is inherent in the whole system here. Uh, it is not a technical uh, misreading. Um, you know, I, I've been over to Iraq seven times now, and a lot of that time has been spent reviewing uh, Iraq reconstruction projects, working with, with Stuart Bowen. Every time I go to a job site, and it's the same everywhere, uh, whether I visit Al Qaim, the uh, KBR's got a project up there at the border entry on the Syrian border. I go through there and I, I try to talk to the workers and uh, had an Iraqi interpreter, which was to no purpose because they were all from India. 
Then I, then I, you know, all these workers from India. Then, then uh, we visit a water uh, sewage treatment uh, facility up near Erbil, and they're all Pakistanis. And then, so I couldn't talk to them. Uh, we went to a couple of pro uh, projects in, in and around Baghdad. They were Chinese and Korean. It just makes me wonder. You know, here we are, we're trying to sell democracy to these folks, the Iraqis. And we're, we're pumping in $12 billion a month there. And yet every job I go to, the Iraqis aren't working. It's like we've got our policy wrong. If we're going to convince them democracy is the way to go, you, you don't do that through the Defense Department. The way you show them that democracy works is to provide them with jobs. If they were employed, maybe, instead of employing, and God bless the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Chinese and the Koreans, but they got major problems in Iraq right now. And if we could provide, we're providing the money, we're providing the construction projects, we're supposed to be providing the oversight and the supervision, it seems to me that you don't export democracy through the Defense Department, you do it through Commerce Department, State Department, and, and letting these folks go to work and actually see what a normal life is like. Take these people out of unemployment. You know, the unemployment rate in, their Iraq, in Iraq among males between ages 18 and 35 years old is probably up over 50 percent. Put some of these folks to work. And, I, you, know, I know, you know, you're probably not the guy responsible for that decision. But somewhere, somewhere along the line, I ought to figure out that if we, we, we put some of these Iraqis to work instead of bringing in the lowest wage workers from around the world and exploiting them, uh, it, it might help the situation there. But I is that the practice? I mean, everywhere I go, it seems to be that the workers are from somewhere else. Even though there's a ton of uh, unemployed Iraqis all over Iraq doing God knows what, uh, we seem to be employing through our tax dollars, through government contracting, we're employing everybody but the Iraqis. And, and I just want to know if that's the policy and is, is that something that you've seen? Mr. Congressman, I employ over 300 Iraqis in the uh, engineering and construction side of KBR's house support for USMI. Out, out of how many people? That's out of 400 and some odd people. So 75 percent of your, your entire department. How about KBR on the ground in Iraq? How about the total number there? I'm not understanding your question, Mr. I am on the ground in Iraq. No, no, I'm talking about Kellogg, Brown, and Root, all your operations. Oh, the whole operation. I don't, I don't have that information. Yeah. You know, uh, all right, I'll let it go with that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Lynch. Mr. Issa, you recognize the five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Mr. Deming, it, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this, is a, this is a hearing in search of an enemy. Uh, and I keep wondering, you know, how many and when they're going to uh, uh, turn on, on you because obviously this has been the Democrat agenda from day one is Halliburton, once managed by the Vice President, KBR owned by him. Obviously, you're bad guys as a result. And, and it's sort of interesting that you're here today as a, as a neutral uh, observer, uh, uh, somebody to give us information. And, 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 you know, it is sort of amazing when it's convenient, KBR is what it is, an incredibly knowledgeable global builder who understands the right way, the wrong way, the expeditious way to do things. Uh, do you see any irony there uh, in your role? I'll defer that comment. You're a wise man. I see the irony, fortunately, for both of us. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not an engineer, uh, but I did, I did once operate an engineer company for the Army and, and, and did a little other work. And what this rat's nest looks like to me is like most of the 20 by 20s we in the Corps of Engineers built. It, it looks like every piece of temporary uh, expeditious building that ever went on when uh, you didn't go for permits and you used Romax or whatever you had to go from point to point to get a job done. Is that what it looks like to you? Yes, it does, Mr. Congressman. I'd just like to iterate that in the National Electrical Code, Article 590, temporary refers to 90 days or less. Would it surprise you to know that 75 percent of Fort Ord when I was there was temporary buildings? They were built in World War II, and I know I look old, but 
I wasn't there in World War II or within 90 days after? Uh, no, no, Mr. Congressman, I was stationed there prior to uh, going overseas with the U.S. Army in yeah. 1971. Now, now, the State Department's estimate, I know you don't have an estimate, is that to, to do the basic compliance wiring for the items that are shown here, it's, it's four to $6,000 to correct that. Uh, I'm assuming that they're going to drive in a, a, a ground on, on the building side and pick up a new ground there. Is, is that something that if you were having to retrofit this, you would figure you could do for, with the labor force cost there, you could do for four to $6,000, just a rough guess? Um, to correct it, simply to make it uh, safe. Mr. Congressman, I, I can't comment on that price. We, we run a different system to make things safe because of the ground and the environment over there. It's called a solid grounding system. Okay, I, I understand it, and, and it was probably more than we can get into for how, how we'd establish a ground. But, but basically, uh, let's switch to another, another question. You've operated out of construction trailers for a long time, haven't you? Yes, Mr. Congressman. You consider them temporary? No, Mr. Congressman. You don't consider a construction trailer temporary? The thing you, you think, please, please, you don't have to say Mr. Please and Congressman. Uh, a, a construction trailer, yes, I do. The environment that we're in there at this particular point in time, it's running over 90 days. No, no I understand that, but uh, uh, I, I just want to make sure I understand. I want to understand that construction trailers aren't permanent. Uh, you, the connection, the actual drop, the electrical drop to uh, a construction trailer is, is a separate consideration. It's done with a, normally with a black multi-conductor that comes down. And, I mean, that you do different connections on a construction site. That's correct. Okay. And, uh, you know, often on a construction site, uh, this kind of, and, and I'm not making any apologies for this kind of wiring, but but these wires uh, and how they're run, these things are they're often done expeditiously, uh, quick order. Is that true on a construction site? Uh, typical wiring is on, on the startup of a project or the ending of a project or during a project is okay. done hastily. Was anyone killed as a result of these mistakes? When I first landed on the ground in 2003, we did have several soldiers get electrocuted to death, sir. As a result of these trailers? As a result of bad wiring. These trailers, uh, not these trailers. Uh, okay, I, sure I just I just wanted to find point. out because I mean that's a separate concern on each accident investigation should be be done. Uh, last question because my time is expiring and it's an important one uh, and I think it's one that we all need to have an answer to. In this combat zone, if you do not source materials at a fairly expensive amount directly from a known source, if you simply buy on the local market. Or, or, or through intermediaries in Iraq, is it likely to get counterfeits? And is that one of the reasons that KBR and other prime contractors pay extra to have known sources they're buying from in the region rather than picking up on the, quote, domestic market? Uh, and I'm particularly referring to these, uh, the micrometer measurings and the counterfeits that obviously got into this project. Um, that would be a concern. Uh but it, it's, it's not common or atypical. We have acquired the proper material in country through local purchasing. Thank you, Mr. Rissa. Ms. Norton, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this hearing. The State Department, we've been hearing for months there, I've been, as well as other um, civilian employees, have I've eschewed going uh, to Iraq, even in the safe zones. Uh, we're trying to get our soldiers all. We, uh, we hope we would leave uh, embassy employees there, and this hearing is important uh, to establish whether it is safe for people to be there and whether the United States of America is making it safe. Now, uh, I understand that uh, you have brought some pictures with you, and I, I'm going to ask a series of questions uh, to try to get to responsibility here. You know, we can look and say, well, you know, you can always fix that. I'd like to know uh, who is responsible. We're now looking at, a, at, at this uh, picture before you. Could you describe for us what the problem is as you see it in your expertise? Ms. Congresswoman, this particular picture here is showing the uh, cabling branch circuits from all the other areas of that particular section modular unit of the defect. 
And this is underneath the defect. This is what, sorry? Underneath the defect, uh, underneath the floor. Um, some of the areas. So what's the specific problem? That okay, you see? if you uh, look at the cabling there, the wire nuts which show the connections uh, where the wires may have been spliced together with, we call them wire nuts, the little red things, uh, typically are installed in a box with a cover. Uh, and, and if also it's not with a cover, what's the problem? So what is the problem? What's the danger? What's the problem? These splices are not done correctly according to any standard or code. There is no supporting on the wire as well as some of the construction. The holes going through the 2 by 4 typically require about an inch and a quarter from the edge. Uh, you can see the holes are drilled right at the edge, which would allow for a nail to puncture the cable. Did KBR do, do this? Was it done prior to KBR? Do, do, did first Kuwaiti do it? Who did this? Um, th this is the BESF camp. KBR did not perform the construction on this camp. Can we go to the next picture? Would you describe, looking at this picture, I if there is a problem, what is the specific problem? I believe what the uh, photographer was trying to depict here is there's no ground bar in this panel. This would be the sub-main panel that is fed directly from the main panel from the generators. When you uh, say no ground, make those, <laughs> make layman, dummies like me understand what you mean. I'm sorry, excuse me, and Ms. What the pro And what, what the specific problem is from, from the point of view of not having a ground bar? Uh, there's always the uh, um, availability of being shocked and there's no protection for the overcurrent device the breakers there to operate properly. Thank you. Let's go to the next picture. Would you describe the problem there, uh, the specific problem in layman's terms? What are we looking at? What's the problem in layman's terms? What's the danger? As you can see, the, uh, the feet <laughs> and this uh, receptacle is on the floor, improperly installed. So the feet, that's where you plug? Correct. Um, and that's a and so what's the problem with that? It's on the floor installed improperly. Uh, it would be subject to water and moisture every time they clean the defect. Who did this? KBR do, did they do, do it? Was it done prior to KBR arriving on the scene? This was done during the construction of the BESF camp, not by KBR. Let's go to the next picture. Next picture, please. Uh, Describe what this picture is. If there's a problem, what is the problem? Okay, these are uh, 100 amp panels installed inside the dining facility. Again, you have to look really close at these pictures. The grounding where the green wires are, the main ground going back to the main panel is uh, not correctly or non-existent. So what, what's, what's the problem from the point of this point again, of view? Somebody in the building, for example. Th this again will uh, um, is a prelude to electric shock and a, a safety hazard, mm -hmm. and the overcurrent devices won't work properly. Next, uh, next picture, please. Would you describe uh, any problem if you see a problem? First, tell us what this is a picture of, and if you see a problem, would you tell us what the problem is? During a one of the technical inspections we had after the event, um, our people opened up some of the commercial cooking equipment installed by others in this defect. Um, on the right side where the brown, blue, and yellow cables are connected to that terminal strip are incorrectly terminated there and the phasing is incorrect. With what result, perhaps? that would uh, cause, we have a hot wire on the neutral as well as on the line, so that would cause uh, a short or 400 volts instead of 230 volts for operation. That may cause a fire. Did KBR install these cables or were they installed before KBR arrived Th on the scene? This was again, Ms. Congresswoman, installed by uh, others. Thank you very Thank much, you. Ms. Norton. Uh, Ms. You, Ms. McCollum, you're recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I'm in a kitchen, whether it's here or if I'm visiting someone and, and, I, and I do travel, I'm, I'm in a lot of developing uh, countries, or if I'm, uh, I have confidence that when I plug something in, I'm not going to receive an electrical shock because there is, as you described, an international code, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, Congresswoman, can you speak a little louder? When I, when I travel somewhere and I travel internationally, and I'm in developing countries quite often, um, I'm in U.S. embassies, I'm in USAID uh, uh, hospital facilities, um, small uh, type of, uh, like a, the equivalent of a Motel 6, not, not even a four-star hotel, but, but just staying someplace. I have confidence that when I go to plug something in, when I go to flip a switch, that I won't be electrocuted because there is an international standard, correct? Not necessarily, Congresswoman. Well, I'm, I'm certainly seeing that based on what, uh, what you're showing me here. I should have uh, uh, very little confidence of, of anything that uh, has been paid for by U.S. Uh, taxpayers' money, that there's been any kind of international standard fo followed based on, uh, on these pictures that you showed me. You would have no confidence without inspecting something yourself before you'd, before you'd plug something in in this compound based on what, what you've shared with us today, correct? Well, let me, let me see if I understand your question, uh, Congresswoman. The countries you've been in, developing countries, uh, the environments atypical of a I'm saying U U U.S. buildings that I've been in where U.S. employees are staying or oh, where right. the USAID has built a hospital or a clinic or embassies um, that, you know, I should fa feel fairly confident that if I flip the light switch, I'm not going to be electrocuted. Correct. Do you, w do you and, uh, but, but from what I'm seeing here and from what you've shown me, especially in a kitchen area where there's water and grease and uh, a lot of electrical appliances being plugged in, um, that th I would be a fool to have any confidence that if I plug something in or flipped a switch that if I was a worker there, I might not be severely shocked or even electrocuted. Well, hopefully the entity that would uh, release the uh, building or, or uh, facility prior to it, it opening to the public would have made these inspections and corrected all those faults. And that, that's kind of the position that we're playing here right now, Congresswoman. So that when you have your employees go in there and they plug something in or, or turn on, a, turn on a, a switch, that you don't have a worker that's severely injured or possibly even killed by this, this poor workmanship. That's correct. I, I found it interesting when um, one of the questions you, uh, you had spoken about counterfeit wiring earlier. And someone said, well, you know, if you follow the specifications, you know, there isn't a problem. Specifications don't ever call for counterfeit wiring, do they? No, Congresswoman. No, I, I, would, I wouldn't think so. Specifications wouldn't call for, as you described in here, an outlet on the floor of a dining area where there's going to be water because people mop it up, uh, to have a non-waterproof flush-mounted uh, plug-in, as one of the, the pictures showed. That, that wouldn't be a specification that uh, a U.S. contractor uh, w would expect going into a dining facility, would they? There are codes that regulate that type of installation, Congresswoman. In your opinion, before um, KRB co comes in to, um, to take over running the facility and using it to prepare the meals, would you have assumed, because U.S. taxpayers' dollars were being used to const construct this, uh, the, even if it's temporary, this dining facility, that there would have been some oversight, some inspection to make sure that when you walked in that day, you could have plugged in the equipment, flipped the switch, and started operating as you had planned? We do perform those inspections prior to operating or taking over a facility. And what was your reaction when you, uh, when, when you sent the cable saying that, th that there, were, there were problems, when you went up the chain of command saying there, there's problems with this? What, what, was, what was the government's reaction who had, who had uh, contracted out and paid for this service? 
shocked, surprised? Had they inspected it? They showed concern, Congresswoman. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Thank you. Mr. Sabanis, do you have any questions? Just a couple, Mr. Chairman. You recognize Thank five you. minutes. Denning, is it? Um, the uh, KBR's uh, connection to all this, I'm trying to understand just, I mean, this is a basic factual question, but in terms of uh, first Kuwaiti was the, was the prime contractor for this base camp or guard camp that was put together, and KBR uh, was coming in behind for what purpose? Can you just tell me that again? We were asked to care for the facilities under operations and maintenance uh, agreement with the uh, Depart Department of State Facilities Management and our client, the U.S. Uh, Army. And when we performed the technical inspection prior to accepting the uh, operations and maintenance agreement is when we started noticing. Okay. It, the, the so first, Kuwaiti was not a subcontractor to KBR in this instance. No, Congressman. No. But has first Kuwaiti been a subcontractor uh, for KBR in other situations? Yes, sir, Mr. Congressman. We okay. have used first Kuwaiti for other services as a subcontractor. Um, in connection with this embassy uh, project or with other things separate from the project? With other smaller projects. Okay. The, um, the problems that you've, that you discovered or found when you got there, uh, for the moment, all, all your knowledge is, is that that's related to the, this guard camp. You don't have any knowledge yet that there's similar problems in the other parts of the project, the larger embassy project. Is that what you said? That's correct, Congressman. Okay. Are the teams of people that are, were deployed on, the, on, on this uh, guard camp, uh, whether electrical teams or others, uh, are they completely separate from teams that might be deployed to other parts of the project, as far as you know, even though they're all first Kuwaiti employees? Do uh, you understand what I'm asking you? No, Mr. Congressman. Can you repeat that? Um, the, the folks that were the first Kuwaiti employees who would have worked on the, the, the guard camp, um, would any of those employees either have worked on the other parts of the embassy project or is there a possibility will work on the embassy project going forward? I, I can't answer that, Mr. Congressman. Um, but that's certainly possible, wouldn't you I say? would imagine so, as it's not a very big place. Okay. The, the extent of some of the other contracts we use First Kuwaiti for is mainly concrete, providing concrete. Okay. Not many, no projects to this extent. I was looking through the submitted testimony of First Kuwaiti, and they said here, with respect to the guard camp that um, that although constructed by First Kuwaiti, it's a project separate from that of the embassy with separate budgets, different First Kuwaiti management teams, and different State Department supervisors. I guess the implication of that being that uh, whatever problems there may be associated with the guard camp or things that could be kind of confined to that because there's these separate management teams and separate budgets. But you've indicated it's certainly possible that the actual employees that we would be deployed to work on an electrical component of the larger project could be, could be some of the same employees that worked on this guard camp. Right? I mean, that's, that's very possible. Uh, to my recollection, uh, Congressman, I, I, I don't know anything about that. Our involvement over there is very limited as far as the correlation between Would you the agree, though, that that would certainly be something we'd want to know 
that you'd want to know. You'd want to know whether the folks that were responsible for this shoddy workmanship, w where they're going next. I mean, what, what's their next project? What's the next footprint they're going to make uh, on the larger embassy project? I mean, you would agree that that would be something reasonable to know. Uh, I'd rather I'd like to defer okay. that question. Mr. Thank Connors. you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Southerns. Mr. Ken, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the holding the hearing and would uh, like to yield uh, to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Let me just give a perspective. This is a punch list item we're talking about. You plugged it in. The wiring didn't work. This is a firm fixed price contract. First Kuwaiti hasn't been paid a penny yet, to my knowledge. Do you have any knowledge that they've been paid anything, Mr. Deming? No, Mr. Congressman. Yeah, I mean, the way this works is they, they haven't been paid a penny. They have to fix it. They have to deliver it. We pay for it. We don't pay for it until it's perfect. And it is not uncommon in construction, whether they are complex construction projects or a temporary project like this, that things in the punch list go wrong. There, sometimes there's painting speckled, something gets damaged and the like. Isn't that your experience, that there are usually numerous punch list items on inspections? Yes, there is, Mr. Congressman. Thank you. I mean, so let's put this in perspective. And my understanding is the cost that it would take for these repairs, uh, wiring and so on, if, if they need to be done, again, we don't know what the specs were, we know what the expectation was, uh, is um, uh, four to $6,000. It, it cost me more to hold this hearing than it would to fix this, and this is under a firm fixed price uh, contract. Uh, let me just ask this. KBR does do business with First Kuwaiti, does, right? Yes, Mr. Connors. You have not found them an irresponsible uh, uh, contractor? Uh, Mr. Congressman, I don't deal with the contracts, uh, only with the projects. And well, but uh, you deal with them on the projects. Have, have, they been, have, they, have they been slow? I mean, have they been a bad contractor? They, they usually work for us in the capacity of providing something. And do they do the good job or a bad job? They do okay. Hmm. Yeah. And all of your knowledge that you have testified on today is about the temporary uh, trailer p uh, area, not the embassy. Is that correct? That's correct. You have really no knowledge about the embassy contract per se, which That's was which was hyped in the headline for this uh, hearing today. That's correct. That's, I just wanted to clarify that. I think that's all I have. Any? Am I, I would yield, uh, uh, Mr. I'd be happy to uh, yield to Mr. Uh, to Mr. Eisen. Thank you. Uh, you're familiar uh, in Iraq with the other temporary structures uh, that our military are military in, aren't you? You, you've seen you've seen the thousands of tents that our troops are in. Yes, Mr. Congressman. And uh, have you looked at the electrical on any of those? We have in the past, Mr. Congressman. Okay, and, and I just just quickly, they've been there more than 90 days, right? Yes, sir, Mr. Congressman. And uh, in some cases, we've had to replace canvas because it sort of eroded uh, over the time of this war. Isn't that your understanding? Yes, Mr. Congressman. But. In fact, what we have is uh, laid on top the ground, black, uh, double insulated, multi-conductor running to those tents from my experience. Is that roughly your experience? T typically on the unit that I uh, run with the USMI, Mr. Congressman, uh, all our cabling, if it is going to ground, even a tent is buried. It's put underground, minimum of two feet or 750 millimeters. Uh, and this is for safety purposes in case there is an event or an IDF attack, we have right, to I run. I, underst I understand that uh, they've been going back and retrofitting. Uh, so perhaps I should have said on my first of many trips to Iraq, this is how they did it, and they've been going back and retrofitting. H have you been involved with other combat engineer type operations, though, over the years uh, in support or past experience? Have you seen how they typically go? No, Congressman. Well, let me just run you through my limited experience. Typically, you come in, with, you roll a trailer in, you roll out uh, some black multi-conductor of the correct amperage, you hook it up, you put the other end on a generator, you crank it up, you got a light bulb going and a couple of plugs. Then as you have resources, you come back in and do updates and modifications and, as you need to be. And then, by the way, no excuse for any safety violations, no excuse for bare wires or absence of grounds, but isn't that sort of the normal way you do it in a combat environment when you bring in temporary structures is you get the things up and operational and get people out of the elements and then you do continuous uh, refinements and improvements. Uh, been your experience? 
Mr. Congressman, I believe the the standards for that would be 281-1. Well, isn't it true that the Corps of Engineers in a combat environment operates under what is necessary to accomplish the mission? Isn't that your understanding in a combat environment? I was not a combat engineer, Mr. Congressman. Okay, I maybe had some luxury you didn't have. Isn't it true that these trailers were made in another country and brought in and that many of, many of these flaws, which needed to be corrected, uh, the State Department says $6,000 worth, would, would normally happen if you had a one-time subcontractor and you're trying to get things done in a combat environment on a temporary basis in order to accomplish a mission? Isn't that reasonable that you, you take the trailer and make the retrofit because you can't afford to wait another four months to get structures? Yes, Mr. Congressman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I have just one question before I let you go, Mr. Deming, and I thank you for your patience on this whole. Given your experience uh, and given your observations out there, uh, knowing that the same company has done the camp area as well as the embassy, uh, and would you advise that we ought to have any concern about the electrical wiring in other parts of the embassy? Uh, I'm sorry, Congressman. Can you repeat the last part Given your part experience, of that? given your observations, and understanding that the same company that is the contractor for the work that you've been talking about is the same contractor for the embassy. Uh, ought there be some concern about the wiring in other parts of the embassy? I'd really rather not make that determination here. Well, no, I'm asking for an opinion, so you don't need to make a determination. I'm asking for an opinion based on your, uh, your background and your observations. I'd like to defer that opinion, Mr. Congressman. I know you would, sir, but I'm asking for your opinion. My opinion, there may be concern here. Thank you, Mr. Deming. I want to thank you very much for your testimony today and thank the members of the panel as well. Uh, we'll, uh, you may uh, have Mr. to Chairman, leave that table if you would. Mr. And Chairman, then point of order. Witnesses will come on. Is, is that, is it, I thought we were doing a second round. No, second round. Second round. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Deming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have a second panel and then a third panel, panel Mr. Nurse. And we'll take about a one minute break here while the second panel gets itself situated, if, if they would. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The committee and the subcommittee will now receive testimony from our second panel. I would like to introduce the members of our panel, uh, the witnesses that are here to offer information about First Kuwaiti's labor practices from their perspective. Mr. John Owens is the former First Kuwaiti construction foreman on the embassy project, and Mr. Rory Mayberry is the former First Kuwaiti subcontractor medic on the embassy project. Thank you both for being here today, for sharing your testimony and experiences. I know it took courage to come here and to participate. Uh, as for your full statements, they're going to be entered onto the record and the transcript. Uh, you may give a brief uh, account of that if you like. Uh, you have five minutes to talk. You may want to summarize your testimony so you try to get it into the five minutes. I'll try not to cut you off, but may remind you if you're going over. It's the policy of the committee to and the uh, subcommittee to swear you before you testify. So I ask you to raise your right hand and stand if you would. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. The record will please reflect that both witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, again, I, I ask you to proceed and remember the five-minute rule if you could. Mr. Owens, ask you to go first. Thank you to Chairman Waxman and Chairman Tierney and the members of the full committee for inviting me to testify here today. My statement will address labor abuse human trafficking, and other concerning issues that I personally witnessed on the construction site at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Okay. Uh, Fine, thank you. My name is John Owens. I've worked on construction projects for many years, and since 2002, I've worked on U.S. Embassy projects. My specialty is architectural finishing, after I finished the U.S. government, working with the U.S. government on the construction of the embassy in Cambodia, I went looking for a new project and I signed on with First Kuwaiti to work on the U.S. embassy in Baghdad. They signed me on as a general foreman on the construction site. In all, I was employed by First Kuwaiti for approximately eight months from November through June, from November 05 to June 06. When I arrived at the site of the U.S. Embassy, the biggest thing that hit me right off the bat was I wanted to know where all the Americans were. Based on my experience working on other embassies, I was used to seeing more Americans on site to manage the construction and direct the workers. It turns out there were two other Americans on site. However, they were not employed by First Kuwaiti. They were employed by subcontractors. I'd like to take a moment to describe the conditions on the site in a little more detail. This was a man camp and by nature not the most pleasant places to be, yet the conditions were deplorable beyond even what a working man should tolerate. Foreign workers were packed into trailers very tight. There was insufficient equipment and basic needs like shoes and gloves. If a construction worker needed a new pair of shoes, he was told, no, do with what you have by First Kuwaiti managers. The contract for these workers said they had to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, with some time off on Friday for prayers. A few people from India told me they were making $240 a month. A guy from Sierra Leone told me he got paid $300 a month. A Pakistani worker told me he made $900 a month, but he had to pay additional costs for his own work permits and visas. And afterwards, he told me he probably averaged about $300 a month. Many of the workers were verbally and physically abused, intimidated, and had their salaries docked for as much as three days' pay for reasons such as being five minutes late sitting down on the job, and other stuff. Because I was the only American on site working for First Kuwaiti, many of the workers thought I had some kind of power that I could help them with their problems. Many workers often came to me and told me that they hadn't been paid overtime, that their salaries were short, and they also came to me with their health problems, often asking me if I could go off site to get some medication for them. It's not uncommon for a construction company to use native workers or even foreign workers to build an embassy. I've witnessed this 
at other embassy construction sites that I've worked on. However, I do believe that if more Americans were on site at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, the abuses I witnessed would not have been taking place. No American company would ever treat people the way I saw people being treated on that job. As I think of it, given the size of this job, my experience tells me that the State Department would usually have far more American staff members on hand to oversee the construction project. I'd like to touch briefly on the issues of human trafficking, uh, human trafficking that I believe I witnessed there. When flying from, from Kuwait to Baghdad, I saw a bunch of workers in the boarding area with boarding passes for Dubai. I was the only one in the group that had a boarding pass that said Iraq on it. When I asked the first Kuwaiti manager, he told me to be quiet and don't say anything. If Kuwaiti customs knew they were going to Iraq, they wouldn't let them on the plane. When we landed, these workers were taken away on buses. There was nobody manning the custom stations, and I just walked through without checking. Nobody asked for my passport. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I believe that I had more experience in building embassies than anybody else on the site. The embassy was not far enough along for me to use my specific skills, so First Kuwaiti put me to work as a security li liaison among other tasks. I think the American people might understand what was going through my head over there as I watched this abusive and unprofessional practice taking place. I kept thinking it would get better. I kept telling myself it would get better, but after more time had passed and things didn't get better, I felt bad all the time, and I realized it was time to resign and maybe speak up for those who don't have a voice. This ends my statement. I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Mr. Mayberry, you may proceed with your opening statement if you wish. I would, like, I would like to thank Chairman Waxman and Chairman Cherney and other members of the full committee for allowing me to come testify today. I believe I am one of only a few Americans that have recently worked on the site of the new embassy in Baghdad. My impressions about how the construction was being managed left me incredibly disturbed. My name is Rory Mayberry. I'm an emergency medical technician. Based on my professional experience and the fact that I have spent four years of as a medical technician in Iraq, I was contacted by MSDS Consulting LLC March 2006 MSDS had seen my resume and wanted to contact me and contract me out to First Kuwaiti, the company that was constructing the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Under the contract, I was to provide, provide emergency medical services on the site of the embassy. I went into this contract with the same good faith as I do with all my other contracts. I wanted to use my medical skills to stop people from dying in a dangerous place. According to my contract, I reported to first Kuwaiti managers in Kuwait City, where I signed my paperwork and received photo identification. Nothing led me to be concerned at this point. A few days later, I was given my flight information to Baghdad. At this point, first Kuwaiti managers asked me to escort 51 Filipino nationals and to make sure that they got on the same flight as I was headed to Baghdad. Many of these Filipinos did not speak any English. I wanted to help them to make sure that they got on their flight okay, just as my managers had asked me. We're all employees of the same company, was my feeling. But when we got to the Kuwait airport, I noticed that all their tickets said that we were going to Dubai. I asked why. A first Kuwaiti manager told me that the Filipino passports do not allow Filipinos to fly to Iraq. They must be marked going to Dubai. The first Kuwaiti manager added that I should not tell any of the Filipinos that they were being taken to Baghdad. As I found out later, these men thought that they had signed up for jobs to work in Dubai hotels. One fellow I met told me in broken English that he was excited to start a new job as a telephone repairman. They had no idea that they were being sent to do construction at the work at the embassy. Well, Mr. Chairman, when the airplane took off, and the captain announced that we were headed to Baghdad, all you know what broke out on the airplane. 
The men started shouting. It wasn't until the security guy working for First Kuwaiti waved an MP5 in the air that the men settled down. They realized that they had no other choice but to go to Baghdad. Let me spell it out clearly. I believe these men were kidnapped by First Kuwaiti to work on the U.S. Embassy. They had no passports because they were confiscated at the Kuwait airport. When the, airport, when the airplane touched down in Baghdad, they were loaded onto buses and taken away. Later, I found out that they were smuggled into the green zone. They had no ID, no passport, and were being smuggled past U.S. security forces. I had a trailer all to myself on the green zone, but they were packed 25 to 30 a trailer. And every day, they went out to work on, a, on the construction of the embassy without proper safety equipment. I went out on the construction site to watch. There were a lot of injuries out there because of the conditions these men were forced to work in. It was absurd. I had been hired based on my experience with OSHA guidelines and compliance and saw guys without shoes, without gloves, no safety harnesses, and on scaffolding 30 feet off of the ground. Their toes were wrapped around the rebar like a bunch of birds. One guy was up there intoxicated on painkillers and I had to yell and scream for 10 minutes until they got him down. I was afraid of blowing the whistle on this because I didn't want to end up outside the walls of the green zone and left to fend for myself. I stayed in Baghdad at this site, the U.S. Embassy, a total of five day days before I was sent home. Once I got home, I contacted the military about what I had witnessed. After much delay and email traffic, the, told, the military told me, in fact, the State Department is in charge of the embassy construction. I've read the State Department Inspector General's report on the construction of the embassy. Mr. Chairman, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. This is a cover-up, and I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to set the record straight. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both for, uh, for your testimony. Um, your, here, your testimony in written form has been put on the record already by unanimous consent, as I noted earlier. Let me start. Uh, the questioning by asking Mr. Owens, uh, so did you observe any physical abuse of workers on the site? Yes, sir. What is it that you saw? Guys getting shoved to the ground. By whom? Uh, first Kuwaiti managers. And um, just generally being pushed around, shoved to the ground, yelled at, screamed at, that kind of stuff. Uh, did you report those incidents to the First Kuwaiti or to the OBO? No. Did you ever witness any First Kuwaiti officials carrying firearms or weapons on the compound site? Yes, sir. And are you aware that according to the contract that First Kuwaiti had with the State Department, you needed permission to carry a weapon on the site? Yes, sir. Uh, did either witness, either of you, uh, witness First Kuwaiti officials, managers, or foremen verbally abusing third-party national workers? I think yes, you sir. indicated you had Mr. Owens, Mr. Mayberry, did you? I didn't hear the question. You witness any uh, verbal abuse by foremen of the uh, nationals? Yes, the, sir. The, of the and to the best of your knowledge, did, did any third country nationals, um, how did they take that abuse and what reactions resulted? What I had seen, they would cower down to them. Uh, they would stop talking. Anything that they had to say, um, they would literally cower down to the management team. Mr. Owens, what was your experience? Yes, that's correct. They would they would back down. Okay. Uh, Mr. Owens, are you aware of any instance where labor was held or detained against his or her will? Yes, sir. What would happen if a labor wanted to leave the work site? I, I, they wouldn't be the triple canopy guards would uh, stop them. They wouldn't be allowed unless they could sneak over the wall. And did you witness any observation, uh, any opportunity with uh, that occurred? Yes. Can you tell us about it, please. Um, one night, 17 Filipino workers went over the wall to find uh, another job in, uh, in the green zone. And how were you aware of that? Uh, they told me. And did uh, you see what happened as a result of their attempt to go over the wall? Well, when they went over the wall, um, First Kuwaiti sent somebody out to look for them. And uh, they brought them back. And I guess they told the ones that got a job with another company, they would told the company was told they would get sued if they kept that that worker that first Kuwaiti had paid to bring him to Iraq so you know they they were supposed to work for first Kuwaiti
Were you aware, Mr. Owens, of any worker safety protection programs or training that was in place at the work sites? None whatsoever. And how did that compare to other workplace safety programs or embassy construction projects on which you've worked in the past? Um, the whole time I was on the site, I never saw one safety meeting, not one. But on other, all of the other uh, embassy jobs that I worked on, there was a safety meeting every week. Did you ever uh, report the lack of safety uh, meetings or uh, incidents on that to any other uh, official? Yeah, I spoke with, it, uh, with Mary French, the project director. And what reaction did you get from her? Uh, it was a conversation. I noticed that uh, there was a lot of guys on the job that weren't wearing hard hats. And they were wearing turbans, you know, where they just take cloth and wrap it around their head. And I asked her, I said, how can they get away with that? And Mary told me that uh, the hats were against their religion. Uh, they couldn't wear a hat, they, they, they had to wear the turban. So I said, well, that, you know, that really won't do much good if a piece of rebar falls, you know, falls on them. And she told me that they believe in inshallah, which means God willing, if they're gonna get hurt or not gonna get hurt. Did workers have access to safety equipment, uh, hot hats, protective eyewear, appropriate footwear? Was there access to those things? Yeah, I believe they pretty much did, but we were running out a lot. You know, a lot of guys would have to wait. It would be ordered. Did you observe any injuries on the workplace? Yes. Can you tell me about that. I uh, just seen guys falling through, uh, you know, stacked rebar before concrete pours, guys falling through it. There was uh, one pretty bad accident where a guy fell off of a building because he wasn't roped off properly, but he was already on the ground by the time I got there. Mr. Owens, were you ever contacted by the State Department Inspector General uh, Howard Congard regarding the allegations that you've made on abusive labor practices by First Kuwaiti? No. Were you ever contacted by Deputy Inspector General William Todd? No. Were you ever uh, contacted by anyone who identified him or herself as a staff member of the State Department Inspector General? No. Mr. Mayberry, were you ever contacted by the State Department Inspector General Howard Krongod regarding allegations that you've made about abusive labor practices by First Kuwaiti? No, sir. By Deputy Inspector General William Todd? No, sir. By anyone identifying him or herself as a staff member of the State Department Inspector General? No, sir. Uh, have either of you been questioned uh, by the Department of Justice with, re with respect to their investigations? Yes, sir. Mr. Yes. Owens, you also? Uh, the Justice Department, yes. I notice that my time has expired, and uh, Mr. Davis, you recognize for five minutes. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank both of you or your, your testimony. Let me just ask you for the record, did you all write, uh, each of you write your statement that you submitted this morning, Mr. Owens? Yes, sir, I wrote it, but somebody spell-checked it for me. Mr. Mayberry? I wrote my own, sir, and somebody spell-checked. And who was somebody, GAO? Yes, sir. Because uh, we have a document here saying the document came from GAO that was put in there. Uh, that's all they did, a spell-check it? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Owen, uh, several press articles report that you have a False Claims Act lawsuit pending against First Kuwaiti. Is this true? I'm here today voluntarily to speak only about human rights violations that I observed. And do you have a claim pending against First Kuwaiti? I'm you sorry, told the committee I'm yesterday you didn't. I'm sorry. You, you told the committee yesterday, you, let me just finish. Um, you, you told the staff yesterday um, that you did not. Um, that could be a false claim if, in fact, you have. But there have been press reports that you do. And I'm asking you now under oath to clarify that if you would like to. Otherwise, we'll proceed accordingly. I am not legally permitted. No, I am, You're under oath I, am, I am under oath and I'm legally prevented from answering that question. Uh, not before a congressional committee. The chair acknowledges, uh, Mr. Davis, uh, that I believe if, if there were such a suit, it would be a sealed suit. You probably would not be able to talk about it anyway. Well, it wasn't sealed in the Wall Street Journal um, no. when they uh, recorded it. But he, I guess what's more disturbing is yesterday uh, he told the committee he did not have anything pending. Um, so that could be a false claim, and we'll explore that uh, all later. How long uh, were you in Iraq working for First Kuwaiti? Uh, approximately eight months, November 05 through June of uh, 06. Okay. Um, 
In your written statement, you said, I felt so bad that I just realized I had to speak up. Um, if, in fact, you have a lawsuit coming against uh, First Kuwaiti, which I think we can assume we have, because if it's a sealed order, obviously, uh, that you do, uh, wouldn't you say that uh, publicly smearing the defendant is also to your monetary advantage? Wouldn't it be? I'm legally prevented from answering that question. I think we get the picture. Um, how many flights did you take over to uh, uh, Baghdad? How many flights? Mm -hmm. I believe four. How many of those flights did you notice the problem with the boarding passes saying Dubai? One. Okay. The state IG's limited review of the conditions at the Baghdad Embassy did not have the same assessment that you did. The Inspector General, the Independent Inspector General, did not have the same assessment regarding human trafficking that you did. Do you think, uh, have you read this state uh, IG's report? Yeah, I, I looked at it. And what's your reaction to it? Um, as far as the, uh, as far as the trafficking, mm -hmm. um, I, I, well, know, I, I uh, can. No, also in, in terms of uh, people living in the trailers and being cramped and everything else. Okay, as far as the trafficking, I c only can tell you that I just told you what I saw on that particular flight. As far as the, wor the conditions of the people working, um, I can only tell you what I saw while I was there. He came later, I, I don't know. I it I might have been cleared up. Right. Okay. Clear. Now, if I understand correctly, you're currently residing in Cambodia? That's correct. And that you were there at the start of the week? Yes, sir. Okay, who paid for your travel here today? Uh, the, uh, the taxpayers? Yes. Okay. Um, have you had any problems relating to your security clearance with the U.S. government? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Uh, was your security clearance valid when you signed a contract to work at First Kuwaiti? As far as I know, yes. Who was sponsoring your clearance? Hardline installation. Okay. And when you signed a contract with First Kuwaiti, were you also under contract to work for another company? When I finished the embassy in Cambodia, I signed a contingent offer to go to Nicaragua and work on the embassy there. That job got construction delays, so I, I emailed Nicaragua and told them I can't wait until you're ready for me, and then I went to Iraq. Did First Kuwaiti ever complain to you about your job performance, such as drinking on the job or being late for work? No. Never had any complaints. Um, did you know that you were being destined for Iraq on that plane? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you know whether those other employees signed documents indicating that Iraq was their destination or not? Do you have any knowledge of that? Um, I just saw their boarding passes were for Dubai. Let me just say, my, I see my time's up. I just want to just up. note uh, one thing on, on Mr. Mayberry. Uh, that he is a uh, previous whistleblower on another case against uh, KBR, who testified here earlier today. So he's an experienced whistleblower, and I know that uh, we'll look forward to our questions. Thank you. That would be, that would be to drive home the point that he doesn't want to tolerate uh, bad things that are happening, I guess. Um, Ms. Watson, you recognize for five minutes. No, I just that he's, ex he's, ex he's experienced, Watson, and the record speaks for itself. Minutes. That's what it's about. Mr. Chairman, could we have regular order, If please? I may, please. <laughs> I believe this is my time. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank these two gentlemen for coming here. And uh, there is no intent on our part to abuse you or to make you, uh, to give you leading statements. I would hope that you would be straightforward when we raise these questions and not feel intimidated. That is not our intent. Uh, the way I do it, I try to get to the truth. And if something that I ask you is uh, misleading or you don't understand it, ask me to clarify it. And uh, I don't intend to uh, have you make statements that you wouldn't make uh, under other circumstances. I just want to set the ground rules. And um, I'm going to direct this to Mr. Mayberry. Um, I have been reading through some background information, and it seems like the safety conditions and standards where you were working within the green zone was not what we uh, would require on other jobs. True or not true? True. 
Was there an incident of a gentleman that was just described up on a high bar without safety equipment? He fell and broke his back? No, ma'am. He didn't. This gentleman didn't break his back. Um, when I had seen him up on the scaffolding, he had no harnesses on at all. And um, I had noticed that he was kind of dancing around and having fun. And that's when I had started yelling and screaming to get him off of the site and off of the scaffolding because he had no harness. It's not a place to play. It took about 10 minutes. Once they got him on ground is when I'd found out he was intoxicated. The intoxication that he had, he had a pocket of some sort of painkiller that he got from the clinic. And that's what he was taking. Um, I couldn't find a translator to get the full story of why he was taking it or what the pain was being treated for. Um, I had talked to First Kuwaiti management in regards to this gentleman and they said, put him back on the site, tell his foreman to work him somewhere else. Now, let me just ask you, the project was being managed by First Kuwaiti? Yes, ma'am. Mary Francis was the overseer? It was my understanding that Mary French was French. the embassy project manager over the I whole see. Facility. Who was she employed by? The United State States Department. Embassy? So she was the overseer. The employer was first Kuwaiti. Yes, ma'am. All right. Who was directly responsible for the health and the safety of the employees on the project? First Kuwaiti. I see. First Kuwaiti has personnel there on the project? Yes, ma'am. Or would it be Mary French? I don't know the re relationship with Mary French and First Kuwaiti. All I know is I was introduced to Mary French of the State Department, and she wanted me to work for her. And once I got on to meet with the First Kuwaiti people, they informed me I was to work for them. So I, in turn, sent email stateside to find out exactly what the contract was stated as and which company I was actually working for. Who would you say was responsible for the health and the safety of those employees? That would be First Kuwaiti. I see. Now, uh, were their employees Kuwaitis? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, who were their employees? Who were their supervisors, their overseers? Um, the management staff of uh, First Kuwaiti. Um, okay. All of the ones that I worked with were Lebanese. I see. Uh, is it true that, Mr. Owens, Mr. Mayberry, is it true that the workers on the project were denied access? to the PX or the BX? That's correct. I see. Is it true that they could not go in there and get medications for whatever was ailing them? Whichever one. That's correct. Was this issue ever taken to Mary French? Yes. What did Mary French do about it when there were injuries, scratches, cuts, and so on? What did she do about that? not allowing them to go into the PX? Um, she didn't do anything. Thank you, Mrs. Watson. Your time has expired. Thank you. Mr. Issa, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayberry, uh, apparently uh, this isn't the first time you've been in front of us. Uh, in June, June 13th of 2005, you were in front of the Senate's All-Democrat Policy Committee. Is that true? Yes, sir. And at that time, uh, Oddly enough, you were, uh, I would say, vilifying, but I'll use the term, speaking about failures of KBR, a division of Halliburton. Is that right? Correct. And uh, in this previous employment, when you were hired by a division of Halliburton KBR, who testified immediately before, before you as uh, skilled contractors, which they, they are, but uh, you went on for a very long time talking about met many of the same things that are going on here today. Isn't that true? No, it is not. Uh, so when you talked about they were supposed to feed Turkish and Filipino meals, but they didn't, they were supposed to pay something, but they didn't, 
isn't that somewhat similar to what we're talking about today? No, sir, not at all. So uh, you, were t you were talking about KBR in 2004. You were talking about a really good company that, that was doing their job and, and respecting the taxpayers' money, right? Sir, I did not hear the beginning of that through the noise. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm understanding is you're a professional whistleblower. This is not the first time that you've taken a job for a relatively short period of time and then come talk to Congress about uh, what you've, uh, you've seen. If, if this is such a bad place and there's so many abuses, is there a particular reason you keep coming back to, uh, to these employers? Well, first, let me address your... No, no, answer my question. My time is very limited. No, the chairman will Mr. not Mr. if you can't answer. ask the uh, witness a question, then Mr. I suspect you give him the courtesy of this is my time. Answer. Mr. Chairman, this is my time. Can Under I regular the questions order. and answers then, please? Mr. Chairman, if you answer my question, is this... Yeah, I asked if this was the first time. You said it wasn't. I asked if, uh, if you're a professional whistleblower. You started answering another question. I asked, uh, because you weren't responsive, I asked... In fact, why do you keep taking jobs uh, in, uh, in Iraq if, in fact, all you seem to observe is a very dangerous place? Would you answer just that question? Why do you keep taking jobs in Iraq if it's such a, a bad place in which uh, contractors do terrible things? And is that for the purpose of whistleblowing, or is that for the purpose of receiving a, a, a payroll and doing a good job? Which is it? It's in regards to supporting the United States and my armed forces is why I take contracts into Iraq. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that answer that you, you go back to Iraq out of patriotism to work for contractors. How much were you paid uh, when you worked for KBR? What was your annual salary? I'm legally prevented from answering that question. You're saying here, Mr. Chairman, could you instruct that, you know, telling what your salary was there is not a legal restriction as far as I know. The witness will make that determination. Okay, the witness is refusing the answer. Uh, Mr. I think we recorded Mr. The Mr. Chairman, answer, this please. is my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Owens, uh, I I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm going to ask you a question that I think you were asked, but I'm going to give you one more chance to answer. Yesterday, did you tell a staff, bipartisan staff, when they asked the question of were you, in fact, in litigation, you said no. Is that true yesterday? I'm only, I'm not asking about today or whether it's true, but did you say that yesterday? Here under oath, I am legally prevented from answering that so, question. So, Mr. Owens, are you saying that you're legally prevented from answering the question about what you said yesterday to congressional staff? Here under oath, I'm legally prevented from answering that Mr. question. Mr. Owens, are you taking your rights under the Fifth Amendment? Are you asserting your rights to protect yourself from incrimination here today? Uh, as far as the Fifth Amendment, no. You're not, you're not, you, so you're not refusing to answer to protect yourself from any false statement you may have made yesterday? I've made no false statements under oath. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to ask that the, the witness be subpoenaed to compel to answer the question as to what he said to our staff yesterday relative to what he's refusing to answer today. I think that's a reasonable request, and I'd ask the chair to entertain that. As I understand it, the witness uh, is under a sealed an order because of seal, a sealed court case not to talk about uh, the litigation. Is that uh, uh, the understanding? I'm legally prevented from answering that question. Okay. Mr. Chairman, my, 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 my request for the subpoena is as to what he said to our staff on a bipartisan basis yesterday, not what he's prevented from saying, but what he may have said yesterday, w because otherwise I think we have to bring our staff in front of us to, uh, to determine whether or not there's a truthful answer or not. Uh, that's all I'm asking for. We, we do have an obligation to find out whether witnesses' other testimony is likely to be truthful based on whether they said untruthful things to our own staff on a bipartisan basis. Well, I'll take it under uh, submission. I'm not uh, prepared. I appreciate that. And if I could just reclaim the time I would have had, I'll be very brief. Uh, Mr. Owens, you and Mr. Mayberry both said that you only had your uh, testimony here today to the ranking member. You said that it was only for, for spell check. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I wrote it out. And they checked it for me. Okay, so when GOA, GO, GAO reports to us that they worked with the witnesses, 
it implies to me that you had conversations or correspondence or discussed what was going to be in your statement in preparation for making it is that true in other words you had conversations about what would be in your statement or some other communication before you wrote it before they spell checked it is that the correct order uh, i answered questions that they asked me but no we're talking about your opening statement for both of you did you write your opening statement without ever talking to GAO, or did you, did you operate in an environment in which you had discussions with government officials, wrote your statements, and then they spell-checked them? Can I Is address this? Yes, Mr. Mayberry. Thank you. We were instructed that we needed statements wrote. We wrote those statements once we left the meetings yesterday. We started on those statements. Mine was completed and forwarded to email address that I was provided, which was Andrew Wright and Dave Turk. They both had my statement prior, that I, prior to being contacted again by the gentleman, David Turk, that he had somebody that could be a third party and look at my statement and spell check it and punctuate the statement. No, no, I appreciate and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I the believe that it's uh, I believe that this it's been clear that there was a meeting, then a statement, then a spell has check. Expired. I yield back. Uh, Chair now recognize Ms. McCullough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ons, where were you born? Long Island, New York. And uh, you were a product of the school system there and you're a proud American. I, I'm assuming that uh, you, uh, like, like Mr. Mayberry, as a United States citizen, uh, went forward to do this job uh, and work on other embassies. Why? It's dangerous work, and it's work that takes you away from those you love. I like working on U.S. embassies. It's, uh, it's interesting the way they're built, and um, I enjoy construction work. And I appreciate you doing that. Mr. Mayberry, uh, you uh, said that uh, you felt that this was a way in which, uh, as a United States citizen, and I'm paraphrasing, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that you were giving back to our country by doing the job that you're doing. Yes, ma'am. As American citizens, as people who are proud of this country, and knowing that this is a U.S. Embassy facility that, that's being built, it appears to me that, uh, Mr. Owens, that you were quite alarmed when you found out that there were individuals on the plane coming to work on a U.S. Embassy, something that you were very proud of doing, that had no idea what their destination was going to be. In fact, they thought it was a very different destination. How did that make you feel as an American? On that plane ride, hardly nobody spoke any English. I don't know what those guys were thinking. Um, like I said, I, like, I, like I said, they had boarding passes for Dubai. I don't even know if they could have read those boarding passes. I don't know. But all I can say is they looked very confused the whole time I saw them. And um, it bothered me a little bit. It, it, it just kind of made me feel bad because I, I think those, some of those guys were really scared once they found out where they were. When, uh, Mr. Owens, uh, did you see any of them after you were um, on the ground on the site, the individuals you were on the plane with? Yes, um, I made friends. There was two, uh, two boys from Sierra Leone on the, on the plane, and I had worked in West Africa before, so we had a lot in common to talk about, and I made friends with them, and I saw them on site after. And uh, did they know that they were coming? Uh, to Baghdad? The two Sierra Leoneans didn't know they were going to Baghdad, but they had boarding passes for Dubai. But they had boarding passes for Dubai. That's correct. And in uh, your encounters with uh, any of the other individuals uh, that they were there, even though there were great language barriers, were any expressing confusion that they were there in the wrong place and that they needed to be uh, some other place? I had heard that from a lot of people over there, whether it was the exact people on the plane, I don't know. I, it's not a nice thing to say when I say that they kind of look alike, but they all dressed alike and their facial features, it, it would have been hard for me to, to remember one from the plane ride and see him in a crowd of say 200 people and know that it was him. 
Mr. Owens, I really appreciate your honesty in answering my questions. Mr. Mayberry, um, what was your impression at, as an American, at, as a citizen, for not only the way that you saw the workers being treated, but for uh, stories uh, that you heard or are things that you can tell us that you witnessed about individuals uh, feeling that uh, they were all of a sudden in the wrong place at the wrong time? I had seen the reaction on the airplane when the captain came on board the PA system and stated that the plane was headed to Baghdad. I witnessed the reaction in that airplane. At that point, I was in fear for my own safety. Number one, I was the only American on that whole airplane. The captain and the crew were not American and the men on that airplane with me were not American. Once the men started getting upset and a weapon was pulled out of that back closet in the tail of the airplane by First Kuwaiti's manager, that's when I got a little more jumpy, kind of stayed to myself. The fear in the faces that I seen was remarkable. I never want to see it again. Thank you, Mr. Maryberry. I want to thank you both as American citizens, people who are proud of the work that you do for your country. When you see something that you think is wrong, feel that in this country with freedom of speech and freedom to, to speak your mind openly to your own government, that you felt like you were able to do that today. And I want to once again thank you very much for coming forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. McCollum. The chair wants to recognize himself for his five minutes and yield uh, to Mr. Tierney. <laughs> Uh, to uh, ask some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I'd just like to start by bringing you up. I know you had to go to another hearing on a, a very important matter. Uh, in your absence, because uh, you came back in the middle of Mr. Isser's question, whatever, there was some discussion or inference from Mr. Isser uh, about one of the witnesses' failures to, um, to comment on whether or not there was a particular uh, lawsuit or whether he said there was a lawsuit or whatever. Um, if, in fact, there's a, what is commonly known as a key TAM lawsuit, pending. If there is such a thing, uh, it would be a sealed lawsuit, as I mentioned before, and Mr. Issa well knew. Um, and I, I think in that case, if a sealed document, any party to that uh, case would not be allowed uh, to talk about it in public. Uh, but I suggest that perhaps we consult with the Department of Justice uh, just to make sure that that's firm or whatever, then let all the mem members of the panel know that so there won't be any, uh, any disagreement on that if, if that's acceptable to the chairman. Mr. Mayberry, let me ask you, uh, when you were first hired, sure. Uh, you know, are you saying, in effect, that that uh, Mr. Issa was aware of the fact that they couldn't talk about this issue, and then he was trying to impeach them, knowing they couldn't talk about that issue? Well, I, I believe he was in the room when I clarified that the first time. I'd have to check with, with people I on see. that. But uh, assuming he was, then he would have known at least my comments, whether he agreed with it or accepted them or not, is another thing. Um, the gentleman proceeds. Thank you. Mr. Maber, you were hired by First Quady as a medic. So would you tell us uh, what you know or uh, let us know a bit about the medical facilities that were available to workers when you arrived at the embassy site? When I arrived at the embassy site, the medical clinics, um, they looked more like a break area. Um, they were filthy inside. There was beds in there, gentlemen laying on them and sleeping on them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on the reception counter coming into the clinic were all these little blister packs with different colors of uh, medication in them. And uh, I asked what they were. And um, one of the Indian medics that spoke a little bit of Eng uh, English stated that it was the medication that they used. I went uh, over to the second medical facility, which was on the uh, construction site, and found the same there. So at that time, um, I had a meeting that afternoon with Mary French of the State Department, and she had asked me what my first in look around the camp was, and that's when I had started talking to her about the lack of supplies, Band-Aids. Um, the, day, the day I got on camp, they were using uh, paper towels and toilet paper and duct tape as bandages. So I had talked to her about the supplies, and she had stated that it was First Kuwaiti's responsibility. And I went to First Kuwaiti and asked for supplies, and they said they don't have any. I, in turn, turned to the military for assistance. And at the time, the military provided me with uh, 
eight jump packs, which are uh, very close to emergency room quality. Two of them were supplied to the State Department, two of them for each clinic, and one per ambulance counted for all eight bags. Now, when I got into Kuwait, the medical equipment and supplies would have been a whole different story if I had gotten my luggage. My luggage was happily camped out in Dubai with the airplane that I was supposed to be on. Okay. Uh, did you make a report uh, to the Department of Defense and the Human Trafficking Office and the State Department about the condition of the medical facilities? Sir, my report was filed with the State Department, Mary French. It was filed with First Kuwaiti Management. It was also filed through the medical facility in Baghdad. Medical facility in Baghdad sent it up a chain of several officers to a State Department doctor. And when was it that you were making these observations? What month and what year? March 2006. Okay. Now, in September, on September 18th, in fact, 2006, a contract modification was added to the first Kuwaiti contract dealing with medical services. It added uh, $1.375 million to the contract. And the provision noted that these extra funds were to pay for, and I quote, a medical trailer, all medical instruments, doctor, dentist, eight nurses, two ambulance teams, cleaning services for the medical facilities, and consumables. Uh, I guess we can infer from, uh, from the existing medical facilities and staff prior to that contract modification uh, that there may have been a difference. Did what I just described in that contract modification comport with what you saw on March of 2006? Was that the condition of the facilities, eight nurses, two ambulances, a doctor, medical instruments, medical trailer, cleaning services, uh, consumables? Were all those things in good condition when you were there in March of 2006? To be honest with you, sir, the only thing that was in good condition at those clinics was the Indian nurses. Thomas, time has expired. Ms. Watson? I don't uh, understand uh, the use of the term professional whistleblower. And so to accuse uh, our witnesses of being professional uh, whistleblowers uh, is an inference to doing this for professional gain. Let me ask Mr. Owens and Mr. Mayberry was your motivation professional uh, monetary gain when you reported what you saw were misdeeds, uh, where you saw were violations of codes, what you saw was maltreatment? Uh, Ms. Dorns. I've never done anything like this before. You know, testify against anybody for anything. Ms. Watson, I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, interrupting here only because we're not doing multiple rounds, and I know that Mr. Why Waxman- Why was that called on? It was not your fault. Mr. Waxman uh, coming back and forth had-, uh, had Well, can they answer my question, not. please? I think he just Thank did. You. Uh, I'm well, sorry, but you Mr. were distracted. I think he said he's never done anything like that before. Right. So thank you. I want to thank both of our witnesses for being here and testifying today. I know it was not an easy thing to do. I appreciate the distances that you've traveled and the, uh, the sacrifices that you've made. We'll take about a minute uh, break Mr. here Chairman. recess, and we'll have the next panel Mr. Uh, Mr. come on directly afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I just want to be recognized uh, to, to ask uh, that, the, uh, that our staff be provided with uh, the original documents in addition to the printed statements so that we can compare the original documents submitted to the Democrat staff with those who that were, uh, in fact, uh, the final copies. Uh, that would be normally within our rules. Could I ask that those be granted uh, as soon as they're available? We'll certainly take a look at that request. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.
testimony uh, from our final panel. I, I want to thank you all for your patience in, in awaiting. Mr. Kennedy, I keep seeing you with different hats on. It's always a, pl it's always a pleasure to see you, Mr. Chairman. I take it you've moved? Yes, sir. I am now uh, departed the Director of National Intelligence and now Director of Management Policy at the State Department. I just thought there were like 8,000 Patrick Kennedys out there. I wasn't sure. Uh, I want to introduce our next panel of witnesses here to offer information about First Kuwaiti's labor practices. They are Major General Retired Charles E. Williams, who is the Director, Office of Overseas Building Operations, United States Department of State. Ambassador Patrick Kennedy, Director, Office of Management Policy, U.S. Department of State. And Mr. William Moser, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Acquisitions, United States Department of State. Uh, and Mr. Howard J. Krongard, Inspector General, United States Department of State. I want to thank you all for your service to our country. I, I want to also indicate that your full written statements will be entered onto the record uh, in the transcript of this briefing. We ask that you try to summarize that as best you can within the five minutes. We'll try to be a little lenient, but I appreciate that you'll try to stay as close to within that limit as you can. It is the policy of the committee and the subcommittee to swear witnesses before they testify. I ask you to join me in rising and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. If the record would please indicate that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, again, I'm going to ask that you please keep your opening statements as close as you can to the five minutes on, on that. And um, does it matter? Anyway? Mr. Bozer, I think um, General Williams, perhaps you'd care to start, Mr. Bozer. I think we put the name plates out differently, but General Williams, if you want to start, then we'll go from there. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. And committee members, I am honored to be here to discuss the State Department's diplomatic construction project in Baghdad. I have a prepared written testimony and I've asked the committee and it has agreed that it be entered into the record. I would like to begin today by putting the Baghdad project uh, into the context of our larger overseas building operations program. It has been my privilege to come out of retirement and serve as the OBO director of, of uh, the overseas building operations for the past six and a half years. Before coming to OBO, I worked in the private sector and served 29 years in the U.S. Army and the Army Corps of Engineers. My career spans in the construction field over 40 years. In 2001, when I became the director of OBO, the department was billing on an average of one embassy per year. In 2006, uh, OBO opened 14 new facilities. Our goal this year is to open 16. Our new embassy compounds are multi-buildings, state-of-the-art facilities, meeting the highest security standards for environmental energy and efficiency. My written testimony states that since 2001, with strong support from the Congress, OMB, o OM, OBO has completed 47 facilities. We have moved 12,566 U.S. government employees out of harm's way by providing safe, secure, and functional facilities, many located in the most dangerous parts of the world. In fact, since my written statement was submitted, an updated numbers show that we have, as of today, completed 50 of these new facilities. We've had three more uh, reach completion since we started this process. We currently have 31 additional facilities under management. Oboe's construction portfolio today is valued at over $5 billion. Oboe has revolutionized this management approach with an emphasis on discipline, accountability, results, transparency, and credibility. In order to replace the 190 aging and unsecure embassy facilities, Oboe reorganized and streamlined the planning, design, and construction processes. We engage often with the construction industry through our award-winning industry advisory panel and our contractor partners. We have a true alliance with the GAO, uh, and in 2006, uh, GAO found that OBO had reduced the time to construct new facilities by two years and nine months from the 1980s and 90s. We've also achieved a high degree of worker safety. In fiscal year 2006, the OBO accident rate was only 6% of the OSHA rate. Mr. Chairman, now I turn to the new embassy in Iraq, which is among the most challenging projects that we have undertaken. 
In 2005, Congress appropriated $592 million for this project. We plan to finish the project in 24 months, a time frame consistent with the commitments we made to the host government. OBO established an office with the sole responsibility for executing the Baghdad project and briefed the concept to the Congress. The compound contains 24 buildings and occupies 65 acres of the 104 acre site. The Baghdad NEC is not new embassy compound, that's NEC. It's not luxurious. Its offices and housing are equivalent to other new construction around the world. The project is on schedule. It is at budget with completion slated for this September. As to quality, OBO is proud of its employees and contractors work on this project. We have received numerous accolades from our tenants as to the extremely high quality of construction. It is among the best that OBO has managed. The Baghdad NEC, as with all of our new embassy compound, will undergo a standard accreditation process to ensure that the facility meets all ethical safety security standards prior to occupancy. A punch list will most likely be generated, uh, consistent of items needing small corrections and modifications. A punch list is a routine feature of every building project. Whether you're dealing with a small remodeling project to your home or constructing a major building. For each new embassy compound project, OBO aligns with the contractor to address these punch list items in an orderly manner. Mr. So Chairman, I would like to turn next to the temporary local guard camp. The camp consists Major General, of since your comments are already on the record, I'd ask that you go proceed, but try to wrap it up as best you can on the summary of that. I will do that. Thank you, sir. Okay. The, uh, the camp consists of prefabricated trailers uh, that local employees who supply guard service uh, will reside. Um, the issue of installing a temporary camp on some of the remaining 104 acres uh, came up about 12 months after we were under construction for the, the new uh, embassy compound. We had a very ambitious period of four months uh, to do this. Uh, we encountered uh, 70 days of road closures. Uh, obviously, uh, trailers having to be brought one on a truck at a time. Uh, we had uh, two months delay, uh, so this is what has caused the project not to be delivered when it was promised. Let me conclude with the emphasis that the responsibility of OBO is to build facilities that are required to our diplomatic uh, standards uh, and requirements overseas. We follow the direction of the department on staffing numbers and requirements and bill accordingly. I want to reemphasize that the Baghdad new embassy compound will meet standards, will be completed on schedule, and within budget. I'll be pleased now uh, to respond to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, would you care to give your remarks? Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before you today. I first want to offer you a brief perspective of someone who has served in Baghdad, and I also want to emphasize the importance of the new embassy compound for the safety of the, uh, our employees there. I recently became Director of the Office of Management Policy in the State Department. As one of my key duties, I have been charged by the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, and the Undersecretary for Management with ensuring that Ambassador Ryan Crocker has everything he needs within reason in terms of support of management. Now let me turn briefly to the subject of this hearing. I want to underline the distinction made by General Williams between the Guard Camp Project in Baghdad and the new Embassy Project. They are completely separate both physically and contractually. The camp is temporary and largely a trailer park, while the NEC is a group of permanent structures. I have been recently in Baghdad and also communicate regularly with Ambassador Crocker. I have been meeting regularly also with Chuck Williams. There is a quality assurance process in place, and there will be a vigorous inspection procedure prior to our acceptance of the NEC as there is for all our new MC compounds. On the guard camp, I view the exchange of cables between the Embassy and OBO as part of the creative tension that exists in getting any project right. There have been problems, but they are problems that First Kuwaiti is fixing 
is part of their acceptance of the guard camp, our acceptance of the guard camp. This is the standard punch list procedure that incurs on any construction project. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I'm at your disposal for questions. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Moser. Uh, I do not have a statement, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kleingrad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and thanks to all of you for inviting me to discuss the Department of State Office of Inspector General's memorandum on its review of the construction workers' camp at the new embassy compound in Baghdad, which I'll refer to as the NEC, the new embassy compound. I personally have made two visits to the NEC construction site. The first visit was in November 2005. That visit to the NEC was a routine part of my trip to Baghdad and was not prompted by any specific allegations of wrongdoing. I walked and rode through most of the site, including the camp which housed the construction workers, and I spoke randomly with members of the workforce, which consisted of many different nationalities. Nothing came to my attention during that visit evidencing any trafficking in person violations or human rights abuses. In the months following my visit, Various allegations came to my attention regarding abuses and misconduct at the NEC, including ones having to do with food, passports, entry into Iraq, pay, physical abuse, living facilities, and medical facilities. Therefore, in June of 2006, I contacted the Multinational Force Iraq Inspector General, who had previously done inspections of conditions in camps in Iraq and I proposed that we conduct a joint review of the construction workers' camp at the NEC. At that time, we agreed to conduct the review together on site in August 2006. Because MNFI IG had experience in inspecting life support areas across Iraq and was planning to conduct a large number of such inspections, we agreed to use the work plan suggested by them. In mid-July, however, MNFI IG was required to postpone the review indefinitely due to other higher priority matters. I, however, believe the allegations warranted an early review in spite of this delay. So the Deputy Inspector General and I traveled to Iraq in early September and carried out a review according to the work plan suggested by MNFIG for a review focused on trafficking in persons and the fair and ethical treatment of a foreign workforce. It's important to note that the review was conducted in a necessarily limited scope. It did not constitute an audit. It consisted essentially of agreed upon procedures or limited procedures and was designed to provide negative assurance rather than attestation. The review included interviews with senior State Department officials and contracting authorities in both the U.S. and Baghdad, private interviews with workers of at least four nationalities, physical review of the entire next site, including kitchen and dining facilities, medical clinic, recreational facilities, computer cafe, telephone access areas, commissary, management offices, and other areas. It included inspection of the private living quarters of each interviewee and numerous other workers randomly selected. Inspection of the various group facilities, such as shower and lavatory, barbecue, religious, recreation, and sport areas and questions asked of workers we randomly encountered during the physical inspection. A summary of the responses received from the workers interviewed and the results of the physical inspection are set forth in the memorandum, which is attached to my statement, which has been publicly available for several months. Because my review was limited, I continued to seek additional inspection from MNFI IG. While that inspection was being scheduled, the management counselor and at least four other senior officials from the embassy, including the regional medical officer and I believe the assistant regional security officer, visited the workers' camp, provided observations that are included in the memorandum, and reported that in general, the camp was adequate for its purposes and the basic needs of food, housing, and sanitation were being met. On two separate occasions in December 2006, an MNFI IG team also inspected the camp. MNFI IG's procedures and experience were significantly more extensive than my own. MNFI IG found no evidence indicating the presence of severe forms of trafficking. After setting forth their inspection results, MNFI IG concluded that except for recruitment fees, illegal in some workers' country of origin, there was no evidence of trafficking in person violations 
and of the 58 areas inspected by MNFIG across Iraq, the NEC camp was rated in the top third with above average quality of life conditions. And a copy of MNFIG's report to me was appended to the memorandum as well. Based on all of the foregoing, including my November 2005 visit, our September 2006 review, management's visit in November 2006, and MNFI IG's two inspections in December 2006, nothing came to our attention that caused us to believe that trafficking in persons violations or violations of the type I mentioned at the outset here today and in the memorandum occurred at the construction workers camp at the new embassy compound. And at the appropriate time, I'll be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cronguide. Mr. Platts, you recognize for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your hosting this hearing. Um, appreciate all of our witnesses for your testimony and, and apologize coming in uh, midway through. Um, when a, and, and General Williams, you may have addressed this uh, as I came in, um, but just to, to reiterate if you did or to clarify, uh, the, the current project as far as being on time and on budget, where do we stand on, on time and uh, budgeting? Thank you, Mr. Platts. That's uh, for that question. We are at 96 percent complete. We are in the pre-accreditation phase. Uh, we are on schedule to deliver in September as planned at the budget. At what was the last part? Oh, at, at the budget? budget, which is $592 million from a supplemental okay. appropriation. And the, um, in, in the, I understand there's uh, a number of contracts that relate to this complete project. Uh, any of those are, are the cost type contracts? We have no cost plus contracts, um, uh, Congressman, because uh, we have experienced that we've done 50 of these around the world over these last six years. We cannot control the cost in these very difficult places, particularly in a war zone unless we uh, use a firm fixed price. This is a firm fixed price contract. And, and that's become the norm now. That has it become the norm, and our appropriators who support us here in the Congress uh, concur in that and, and desire that. The, um, of, of the contract, there's one or, or more that are sole source contracts? There are actually two contracts that are sole source. Okay. The, the Chantry compound for the construction of the unclassified areas of the Chantry was sole source, but that was done only after a competition produced no viable bidder. In other words, it was subsequent to the competition. And the guard man camp that we discussed earlier today was also sole source, but that was done for the reasons in, in order to get a camp stood up as soon as possible so that uh, guards could occupy a suitable facility to provide security to the facilities on the ground in Baghdad. And, and that's part of that uh, basis for doing a sole source is if there's an urgent this need. This one was done on right. the, the guard camp was done on the basis of urgent and compelling reasons. Uh, who, who reviewed and approved those being sole source? Uh, the uh, actual sole source justification was uh, signed by Gregory Starr, who was the head of the diplomatic security services. I think at that time he was one of the deputy assistant secretaries, uh, deputy assistant secretaries in diplomatic security. It was reviewed by our attorney, our acquisitions attorney, Dennis Gallagher, and it was further uh, reviewed by the head of the contracting authority, who was part of my staff, and that is Kathy Reed. Okay. Um, Mr. Reisha, I'm, I'm going to uh, yield, balance my time to Mr. Reisha. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. General Williams, uh, this is the first time we've gotten to be together in this role, and I just want to commend you for your six years, certainly all your years of service, but the six years in which I've watched you turn around mm -hmm. what was a, a national disgrace, the mm -hmm. fact that we couldn't build safe embassies, have them delivered on time, and certainly not on budget. You've changed all that, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the, the new center in, uh, in, in Lebanon, I'm not talking about the new embassy, but the, uh, 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 the visa center that you stood up there on time and, and, and when no one else had been able to do it in a decade. Uh, so you, you've made a great deal of progress. And I just want to have my, uh, Mr. Platts actually finishing off question, having you take reference to the oversight and reform where it says allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse in U.S. Embassy in Iraq. Now, as a matter of just pure fairness, is there any waste, 
fraud or abuse in the construction of the u s embassy in iraq when it's coming in on time and on budget congressman in my opinion no i travel all over this country a hundred all over this world a hundred and seventy four trips i'm in and out of iraq this project is going to be good quality it's going to be accredited uh, and it's going to function it's going to come in at or below the five hundred ninety two million dollars and we're going to be on schedule i thank you and i just want to point out that five hundred ninety two million is about what we're spending to be two or three actually four years late putting in something here at the house of representatives so it is amazing that uh, that we can't find a way to build something right here in the shadow of the capitol and come in on time and under budget just the opposite we're, we're double the time and double the budget and, and by the way, although Washington is not the safest city, no one's going to call it Baghdad. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Ellen yields back. Uh, Ms. Watson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, and I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, just yesterday, we passed a bill uh, out of, off the House floor that would prohibit uh, permanent bases in Iraq. Uh, when this issue of building the largest embassy in the world, uh, came to us, I thought it was very curious because we intend to leave uh, sometime soon, I would hope, mm -hmm. and we're investing all of this money in the Baghdad embassy, about $600 million. And I'm wondering with the number of people, I think the uh, population is somewhere around 68 million, we're building the largest embassy in the world. That looks like we plan to stay there for a long time. Now what I understand that the man in charge of the project for the State Department, James Golden, has not laid eyes on the construction site for the past two months and will not do so during the remainder of the project. Now through interviews of Mr. Golden and his subordinate Mary French, we have learned that the ambassador ordered Mr. Golden to leave Iraq in May of 2007 and that he's not been allowed to return since then. In fact, Mr. Golden was escorted off the premises by armed guards. So, um, Ambassador Kennedy, this seems like an extraordinary step. Why did the ambassador, Ambassador Crocker, expel Mr. Golden from the embassy construction site he was supposed to oversee, and I'm compelled by what um, Major General Williams said, that this site is going to come in on time, come in on budget, and come in uh, with the kind of standards that will protect Americans and other people there. Ambassador Kennedy. The, uh, Ms. Watson, the, the actual on-site project supervisor for the construction in Baghdad, who is delivering the project on time and on budget, as General Williams said, is Mary French. And is Ms. she responsible for overseeing the project? She yes. Is. Yes, Congress. Yes, yes, well, ma why was Mr. Golden in that position and ordered out of Iraq? Mr. Golden was never in the position as senior project director. Oh, Mary so we Fritchett. have incorrect information in Mr. front of Golden, us? Mr. Golden's uh, function is the managing director of our emergency project coordinating office, under which the Baghdad project is one of the few. We have Harare, we have several projects under that. Is he still there? Uh, he's not in Iraq. He's back doing No, the he's not in Iraq. That's no, the question. He was never intended to be in Iraq permanently. Well, was he in Iraq? No, he was never in Iraq permanently, Congressman. He made visits, as I do and others do. <laughs> um, can you clarify something for me? I understand that Mr. Golden, under his statement of work, was to make site visits to Iraq, correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay, did he ever make a site visit to Iraq? Oh yes, many times. Oh, th that was my question yeah, but he's earlier. Not he's not uh, hold on, hold on. Yes, is the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, was he ordered 
out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, um, the ambassador indicated that he, that he felt comfortable that Mary French, who was the on-site project minute, supervisor, would- Wait a minute, wait a minute. Would you answer would my question? Was Mr. Golden ordered out of Iraq? Am I making myself clear? Was Mr. Golden ordered out of Iraq? The ambassador indicated that he did not wish uh, Mr. Golden to, to come to Iraq on any further times. Very good. Can you tell me what led to that decision? There was a, there was a discussion about following, following procedures at post, and, uh, and the ambassador indicated that he wished M M Ms. French, who was the on-site project supervisor, to finish the project, as she, as she had done so well all along. So Mr. Golden was there and got into a discussion mm -hmm. with the ambassador mm -hmm. about the procedures mm -hmm. The oversight procedures, is that correct? No, it was not a discussion with the ambassador. It was dis a discussion of operating procedures, and, and um, Mr. Golden, as the general indicated, had other, has other responsibilities, significant responsibilities, such as our embassy in Harare mm -hmm. is part well, of his Well, tell functions. me this. If Ms. French was going to do the job that Mr. Golden thought he was to do uh, and was told by the ambassador to leave Iraq, mm -hmm. then why did it take armed guards to remove him from the, <laughs> assemb uh, from the embassy grounds? I, I can't, uh, uh, since I wasn't there when, okay, when, 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 when Mr. Golden was General Lady's, table General Lady's that? time has expired. Uh, Mr. Isom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> General Williams, uh, Again, thanks for your many years since 1960 of uh, s service to our country, uh, service that I note uh, you've done at uh, very, very small compensation by comparison to private contractors. Uh, and you've chosen to do that, I think, out of a sense of patriotism, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, were you in the room for the previous panel? I was in the side room, Congressman. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So. Uh, I'm going to follow up on a little of that because you're the expert. You're the person with three decades in the Corps of Engineers and another two decades in right. construction. Uh, the estimate of the State Department, which would be you, was that these trailers had, at least in the specific allocation, six or eight thousand dollars or less to to make right some uh, some punch points of, of of mistakes. Some of them grievous, but mistakes: bad wiring, absence of a junction box, and so on. Is that your understanding? Yes, Congressman, and let me just amplify here. Um, for someone who uh, served two years in Vietnam, um, I lived in a trailer park. I know what a trailer park is. I know the difference between a prefabricated trailer park and permanent construction. It is temporary. And in my professional opinion, after 40 years, you never get something that's temporary correct. You are constantly improving it, and it's all a function of who follows who and et cetera. So none of this is alarming uh, to the extent that uh, it's uh, putting us in a situation where um, uh, we can't correct it. We have not paid the contractor. We have all protection there. These are punch list items. They happen on every single job. And uh, I just frankly don't see the issue here. It's temporary, defined to be anywhere from one to, to two years or less. And it's for an element that will not reside on the new embassy compound. Thank you, General. And, and you know, I've characterized this as a hearing in, in search of a villain. So uh, right. I don't see it either. Uh, you know, uh, the other day we did have some serious concerns about uh, FEMA delivered trailers yes. Uh, yes. out of 100,000, 120,000. Right. Some of them just flat were bad. Right. Now, that was here in the United States where you make a phone call and the things roll in, pulled behind somebody's pickup truck, or they mm -hmm. drive themselves in, or mm -hmm. they come in on a flatbed. Uh, can you characterize what it takes in a combat zone to bring in modular housing, trailers, right. heck, water, anything? What, what people went through and why you would accept something that came in that wasn't quite up to snuff and make it right later rather than wait four months to get somebody inside housing? Thank you for that question, Congressman, because these trailers were manufactured in a plant somewhere in the Middle East, 
they had to be um, transported, one trailer, one truck at a time. There were 380 trailers that had to be transferred from uh, as close as Kuwait, but even further than Kuwait. Um, it was uh, a monumental task. Uh, we had 70 days of road closures, uh, and the trailers uh, arrived. Uh, they were as we had uh, had spec them out. Uh, yes, they had the odor of formaldehyde because it's my understanding that um, uh, this is uh, used for other preventive measures. Uh, to make certain that there were no issues with our trailers, we followed the protocol that was laid out by the manufacturer, and that was to air them out for a period of time. Uh, our industrial hygienists that are part of my staff concurred with that protocol. I have learned from Post um, uh, recently that uh, there is no odor left. Uh, we're going to go one step further and continue to monitor those uh, trailers to make certain that uh, everything is fine. I think, Congressman, we have done everything that we could do, can do, under the conditions that we've had to work. Uh, one final question, because I think it's a cultural one in nature, and I'm very concerned that we respect cultures of people we bring into countries. If somebody is Sikh or some other religion uh, where they must wear a turban and they will not wear a hard hat, what's been your experience when you have to deal with that? Uh, what is construction done like in India and so on? Yeah. Is, there, is there essentially the, a reasonable allowance that has to be made uh, when you have that situation that is not consistent culturally with our norms, because that was in the earlier testimony. Thank you, Congressman. I, uh, as I mentioned, I've been all over the world, uh, every corner, every country, 170 different posts and locations. We're working in about half of those. Um, culture is an issue. Uh, I'm very sensitive, and I make certain that our staff is very sensitive to culture. We have to be. Uh, I meet and greet uh, workers. I don't spend much time in the embassies. Everyone knows that. I shake hands with them. I take pictures with them. I talk with them. And I'm very sensitive about their religious uh, cultures. And uh, Mary French handled this as delicately as anyone could handle it. Mary is not new at this. She's 32 years of experience, registered architect. She knows what she's doing. 20 years with Marriott. She's built buildings before. She is very sensible and reasonable and careful. Thank, Thank you, you, General. Thanks again for your service. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, Mr. Tierney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Krongard, if I might ask you a few questions on that. How many, well, I guess it was three to four individuals that you interviewed when you went uh, on your inspection? The formal interview process was about a half a dozen and roughly, give or take, and then randomly, I'd say I spoke to probably several dozen others. So six that no, you I told said that you six of the formal and so about formally some interview. fifty or more others. And you took notes and, and put that into a report. Uh, I the, the notes were hard to take, um, and uh, they were on the backs of things because I didn't want people to think I was I didn't want to make them uncomfortable and think that they were being transcribed or anything. But I took notes and they found their way into my report. Okay. Now. First, Kuwaiti is the one that selected the individuals to whom you would interview. Is that a typical uh, way to operate? Well, in this particular circumstance, I had no other way of doing that, but that's why I particularly you know, wandered around and spoke, as I say, to several dozen others selected randomly. Why was there no other way for you to do that in this instance? I don't uh, know how I, who I would have selected. I didn't have a roster of uh, hundreds and, or even thousands of employees that they had, and it's correct. I mean. People have thrown out this conspiracy theory that somehow First Kuwaiti um, stacked the deck. Uh, I can only tell you that uh, my sense of the demeanor of the people that I spoke to was that they were being open and honest with me. The people that I randomly selected, I have every confidence, were being open with me. But most important, sir, I was not there in Iraq. MNFI IG was there. They do this all the time. They are the experts at this. They inspected 58 camps, so I asked them to do even more, and they, their formal interview was, I think, 37 uh, people, 
and they were confident that they had uh, open and candid responses. On, on your interviews with about 10 to 15 percent of the people that fluently spoke English, why didn't you take a translator with you? I did have a translator with me when I went randomly. Uh, I don't know where your 10 or 15 percent comes from, but the- Ms. Um, French. Pardon? Mrs. French. I, I mean, I just don't know that. Yeah. But there were certainly a large number of people that did speak English. Uh, and, but during my wandering around, I did have a translator with me. Uh, you mentioned a series of allegations that led you to undertake your investigation. Did you follow up with the specific individuals who made those allegations? Sir, I have, um, I was provided with the transcript of the interview that was given to Mr. Mayberry by the Trafficking in Persons Bureau. So I had Mr. Mayberry's uh, testimony. Did I, you follow up and speak to him directly? I had no reason to speak to him directly, and I, sitting here today, I have no reason to. I had everything that he said. Uh, David Finney has published everything he's said. Some of the things that he said I saw with my own eyes. Well, let me were, just say, he saw things in March. You went there in September. Uh, so you thought there was no reason for you to question him at all about any disparities or differences that might have arisen at that point in time? You didn't want to inquire deeper into his observations? No, I had everything he said. And by the way, sir, I had been there the year before. I was there before he was. Right. But, you know, you did a, a more intensive investigation the second time, if I'm not correct. Is that right? Sir, when I look right now at the transcript of his interview with Trafficking in Persons Bureau and I see some of the allegations that were made, they were contrary to what I saw and experienced. In every post around the world, and I have oversight responsibility for some 265 posts and missions around the world, the vast number of those have some disgruntled employee and they make all kinds of allegations and they may be true. I'm not saying that they're not, but I can't possibly start out by saying that anybody who makes an allegation, I should personally interview. Well, other uh, than I, the I was given this transcript from, of Mr. Mayberry I and I had all of the things that he said in the newspapers. Other than the minutes. two site visits that you made, who else did you uh, talk to in order to investigate the allegations? I'm sorry, sir? Other than the two site, the, the individuals that you talked to on your two site visits, who else did you talk to during the course of your investigation? Well, first of all, I didn't do an investigation. Uh, I've tried to point that out. Uh, this was not an audit. It was not an investigation. This was an agreed upon procedures and a limited review, which I also did in conjunction with visits by the management committee. I did it in uh, the management counselor. I did it in conjunction with two visits by the MNFI IG, who were really the experts at this. They didn't, they didn't go there until sometime after you went. In fact, you tried to go there with them, and they weren't able to make it, and so you went on your own with the deputy. Is that correct? Yes, but not very long after. Okay. Uh, I was there in September. They were there in but December. But you're telling me that you took no responsibility in your position as Inspector General to do an inspection or to do an audit on your own on these serious allegations? I believe that I did that, sir. All right, I mistook that because I thought you just said you didn't do a, a thorough audit. I did what I thought was appropriate. I tested the credibility of the allegations. I looked at what was said, and I thought that I did an appropriate job, and I think today I did an appropriate job. My time has expired, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. I want to recognize myself. <clears throat> uh, we, we've heard allegations about uh, concerns raised by embassy staff and KBR about the quality of First Kuwait's work on the embassy complex uh, guard camp. And given that this is the same company that is going to be responsible for the construction of the permanent buildings at the embassy complex, I'm also concerned about the quality of work on those buildings. We've learned that the State Department officials have had concerns about the design and construction of key systems at the new embassy. John Arsinski, the Deputy Director for the Iraq Project Construction Office, has told committee staff that in reviewing designs prepared by First Kuwaiti, his staff identified concerns about the fire protection system, the HVAC system, the power plant that could have affected the operation of the embassy facility. This office uh, th is the part of the OBO dedicated to the embassy project. For example, there were concerns that under First Kuwaiti's design, there were not enough ductwork fans to evacuate smoke from a fire so that people could exit the building safely. Under First Kuwait's design, the wrong electrical materials 
for the fire alarm system would be used. And the first Kuwaitis designed the electrical power system might not operate correctly when the building is fully up and running, which could lead to blackouts. And according to Mr. Archinsky, the Iraq uh, Project Construction Office sent back the fire alarm system's designs to First Kuwaiti three times, and each time got back designs that did not address their concerns. General Williams, is there any reason that First Kuwaiti ignored proposed corrections to design flaws identified by your staff? Well, I don't think they ignored them, <coughs> uh, Chairman Waxman. Let me just explain uh, this process. There's always on um, uh, these um, uh, embassy compounds and, of course, and all the other construction that I've done, it's always give and take uh, around uh, designs and submittals and so on. Um, we have a ongoing process where we invite uh, the particular discipline that uh, we might have concern about. In this case, it would be um, fire uh, engineers. Uh, at my request, they made the normal visit out, and we want them to dig and look and turn over every rock. And I expect a report to come back identical to the way it came back uh, so that we can be more vigilant about it. We take that report, we uh, use it as a quality assurance uh, to make certain that things are done correct. But well, I appreciate real, that. But, but the real, uh, if I could, sure. the sure. real rites of passage, if you will, for everything that we build on an embassy is a accreditation process, which occurs, uh, about to occur now on the new embassy. Uh, it will uh, judge how the embassy was built. Because prior to building, I think you know this, Mr. Chairman, we have to certify to the Congress that around a design, this is what we are going to build. So the accreditation team comes back uh, at, at about the 98, 99% uh, level and accredits that. That process will take place. There's no way to have or to put in place a new embassy compound that does not meet our specifications. The general, there's a lot of give and take in the General, I appreciate that. But when the installation work began, the construction office conducted an inspection of the fire safety system and identify the following problems. The inspection determined that First Kuwaiti had installed the wrong size conduits in the alarm system that had to be fixed. The inspection determined that the pipes for the sprinkler system were not connected properly and could break apart under pressure. Are, are you concerned about these problems that your staff identified or you just hope that uh, when you do the accreditation it's going to be uh, corrected? One of the documents we asked to see before this hearing was the fire safety report that documented the problems we've been talking about. Mr. Archinsky talked about this report in his interview with the uh, committee staff, but this is being withheld from the committee. I don't understand why it's being withheld. Hiding bad news will not make bad news go away. It usually compounds the problem. So I, I want your response to this. Are you concerned yes, be, about these problems that I'll your be staff happy, has identified? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. I'm concerned about every single problem, and I think anyone who's been in an earshot of me for the last six years know this. I turn over most of these myself when I go. Uh, I'm looking for them. And any time a report comes in to me, I audit the fire people to go out, as I do on all of these, go out and take a look. I send electrical people out. I send mechanical people out, et cetera, et cetera. I want to be absolutely certain because there will be a accreditation process, and I want these things corrected. I have found with this contractor that there's never been any shyness on correcting what we bring to their attention. They want to get it right. They've tried very hard to get it right. They're not perfect. I've never seen a perfect project. There's always, when you install in something of this magnitude, there are things that are not exactly the way they should be. And that's the reason we have these, these uh, checkpoints in the process. We have a good process. And if you look at the 50 embassies that we have built, uh, they will meet the test and the standard. The guard camp went through the same process. No, guard camp is a temporary facility. It does not, is not subject to the rigor of a permanent facility. I see. Uh, so it's so the fact that that was all messed up with all sorts of problems shouldn't be taken as evidence that one, you didn't have a process that worked, and two, the company that did that work shouldn't be held accountable for it or thought 
maybe would be doing poor work on no, the embassy. No, no, Chairman Waxman. The company that built it should be held responsible for doing everything that they set out to do. And as I mentioned earlier, we have not paid them, so the government has no issue here. Uh, any of these issues that uh, we feel that clearly on First Kuwaiti's plate, uh, they have been or will be taken care of. But as I said earlier, for someone who uh, spent two years in, in, in Vietnam and lived in a, tr a, a camp, uh, you never get a camp right. Uh, you constantly are doing things to it, and it's sort of in the eyes of who comes after you. So, but we do the best we can with it to make it work. Well, my, my time has expired, but I just want to say that, that KBR complained that this wasn't being done properly. It still wasn't fixed. And then uh, your own people went out and came back with the same problems. It still wasn't fixed. And I, I just think that that's an indication of a system that's not working the way it should. And I, that's why I'm asking all these questions, but it's, it's uh, Mr. Shea's time. Is it possible for me to respond to Certainly. that? Certainly. Go ahead. Uh, our people, uh, my people did not go back to the man camp uh, on uh, to and, and come back and say that things were not done. I, if what I recall is I have 80 union workers on this project, all Americans. And to make certain that this camp electrical part was was right. Well, uh, let me just let me just say that I have a document that I'm sure you've seen, and it mm -hmm. says, within this document are the results of the commissioning of the DS man camp on the west side of the new embassy complex in Baghdad, Iraq. As noted within the enclosed documentation, the camp meets and exceeds the requirements of Section C of contract, and then it goes through within the camp are the following structures, and it's certified. Well, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. If it turns out they certify it, and then it's not, uh, it's not meeting those expectations. Well, there is a punch list on every single piece of work that, uh, that, that I think anyone has ever touched. And this was uh, KBR coming in, and they looked at things. And uh, we had, as my friend here said, some discussions about them. And uh, we'll correct those that. Um, KBR came in after the punch list. Yes. So they came in okay. after the punch list and said, these yeah. things are not. Good. Doing the the way they're supposed to be. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Shays. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you to the witnesses. I, um, I, I, as I have listened to today's hearing, I, I, I came in with an open mind, concerned particularly about one, the cost of a facility that costs five hundred ninety-two million dollars. That's a lot of money. Concerned, this is a rather big facility, but recognizing that you're basically going to look to house everyone within the, the compound, which makes it much more expensive. I'm struck by the fact that there's really no contention that you aren't on time uh, and that you haven't stayed within cost. So that's a significant fact to point out. Uh, there is no project that is not going to have issues about the quality of work in certain places. The issue is, how have you dealt with it? I am struck by your testimony and the witnesses that have testified that you've dealt with it pretty well. But who knows? Maybe there'll be some report that finds something later that you haven't done well. That's right. The one thing we can be certain of is you've done a heck of a lot better job in building this facility in a war zone than we have done in staying within cost and in within time in the visitor center here in the capital. That's very clear to me. Mm -hmm. um, what is uh, disconcerting to me is the continual uh, uh, confusion of a workers' compound in temporary trailers, now temporary more than 90 days, but not permanent. They're going to be taken down right. uh, and mixing that up with the facility. Right. Now, and then when we look at the uh, KBR's uh, first witness, it, we, we're basically looking at something under $6,000 worth of mistakes, not tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, not millions, certainly not billions. So I'm struck with that. What concerns me is the issue that it relates to employees. One, I would have liked these to be uh, Iraqis. Uh, first, tell me why they couldn't be Iraqis, and then I want to go from there. 
Congressman Shays, we tried very hard to uh, vet and get Iraqis to work. This was our first choice, um, I, at least the contractor's first choice. Uh, I'll let my colleague, Ambassador Kennedy, speak to the difficulties of getting that process through the, the green. Give me the short version, not the long version. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shays, there are two issues here. One is that because of the security situation in Baghdad, their Iraqi employees are truly afraid to transit in and out of the green zone. Secondly, they, we have not been able to find an easy way to vet run police checks, run security checks on Iraqis because of, because of the problems that are currently present in the country, and therefore we did not want to inject an element of bringing employees onto the site who might do not what we wanted them to do, but to do something nefarious. Okay. And so first choice, hire local, but if we cannot hire local for, for a variety of reasons, then we must go to alternate means of employment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Inspector General, uh, my um, I'm looking at a document, it's from the Inspector General, correct? Um, and it says basically uh, several NEC TCNs reported that fraudulent hiring practices were used during their recruitment. They stated the promises made and the terms of the original contracts presented to them in their country of origin were inconsistent with the actual conditions, low pay, longer hours, no days off, of their employment in Iraq. In all cases where deceptive hiring practices were evident, the workers originated from, from the Indian subcontinent countries of Nepal, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. The deception was from recruiting agencies that were being paid by these workers if they accepted these jobs and traveled to Iraq. Additionally, some workers were told to sign contracts in their home countries in English even though they could not read or understand the text of the contract. That seems to me to be a pretty serious problem. And um, while we can't necessarily call it slave labor, doesn't it suggest that the people who were contracting these people may have made out like bandits, while the people who ended up working in Iraq were clearly uh, being abused, given they didn't get everything they expected in terms of pay, and given that their hours may have been longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Put in context that, it, it seems to me that's a pretty strong indictment. Yes, sir, it, it may well be. The question is, who is it an indictment of? And it is mainly an indictment of recruiting practices in the Indian subcontinent countries. Uh, I don't really have the jurisdiction well, okay. to. I know you don't have the jurisdiction, but maybe I could ask all of you to address it. This is what I think this hearing should focus on. We can't wash our hands of the fact that we ask someone else to do the recruiting, and in the end, we end up with people who have been, in fact, brought in, getting less pay, uh, and not being, uh, getting the, the employment they thought, uh, while the people who did it uh, seem to have made out quite well. And I, I guess what I want is, uh, what's the difference? Uh, if, I, if I may, and I don't want to be in the position of defending these recruiters, because I'm most certainly not. I want it on the record that I very much disapprove of that. We have recruiters in this country who do things that I disapprove of. But I did go back to First Kuwaiti because I wanted to know whether they had any relationships with these recruiters or they were sharing in the uh, making out like a bandit, as you say. And what I was told, and it, based on my discussions, limited though they were, it was supported that First Kuwaiti itself was not using recruiting agencies, that they did not have any direct relationships, that they did not share in any of the profits, uh, that for the most part, the people that they came in touch with who became employees on the new embassy compound site had been hired by other construction companies on other sites and then had switched yeah. over let, to First let Kuwaiti. Let me interrupt, though. Uh, it was our money that was paying these folks, wasn't it, ultimately? No. I don't know how you can say no. Um, Aren't we paying for the embassy? We're paying a fixed price for the embassy, that's correct. Right, and so, uh, you know, it may not be our taking and writing out a check to them, but it's basically our dollars going to be used in this embassy, hiring contractors and others to do the job. Don't we have some moral responsibility to make sure that the employees who are working there aren't being taken advantage of? And I, and I would in ask for indulgence of the chair just to pursue it with the others. So uh, do you have a comment on that? I'm sorry, I, I don't believe that I have any authority to enforce the laws of Nepal or uh, uh, of Sri know, Lanka. I, uh, I really don't. You know, I'll just say, I, I, I'm really not asking whether you enforce it. You, you were clear 
as to what you were saying, you were saying, you know, uh, these people were taken advantage yes. of. Um, and, uh, but it seems to me uh, that it rests on our shoulders because we're the ones who are ultimately paying the people to build this. Uh, and, and, and sir, I have advised the Department of Justice of that. Okay, let me ask the state and then we'll go from, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just yeah, just a quick note, uh, uh, Congressman Shays, before I pass to my procurement colleague. Um, every matter that relate to the human element uh, in the area that I supervise is important. Uh, as part of the pre-construction conferences with any contractor, American contractors, because you know they get their work done with foreign workers. So it's not just an isolated matter here for, uh, for First Kuwaiti. Uh, we say to them, we expect you to uh, be very, very much in line with uh, our rules and regulations. But, as much but as they we were. Can. Pardon me? It appears that they were not. Well, no, we, we say this every time that we hear one of these uh, yeah, allegations. General, General, I just have to say, yeah. saying it and somehow enforcing it with how we reimburse and so on, there should be some mechanism that holds us accountable. And I realize I'm a little over time, but I would like to just have Mr. Moser yeah, Before you do that, just yield for me one second. Sure. Uh, I think you're on to the nub of this, this part of the hearing. The subcommittee's part of this hearing is on this, and that's what we thought was important. We all know what we're de dealing with here, and, and I don't think anybody's comfortable. I wouldn't right. suggest that any of you gentlemen are comfortable with what's going on. So the question is, right. why don't we have it in the contracts to people like Kuwaiti Inc. or somebody like that, Mr. Moser? Why isn't it a contractual matter that they make sure that even if they try to outsource the hiring or if they accept the work, I mean, I don't really buy that everybody just showed up, 3,000 people showed up and they were actually hired by somebody else and just hopped over the fence to Kuwaiti or whatever. But why aren't they responsible for the recruiters and recruiters' bad practices and then that company responsible to us so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. Well, Mr. Chase, I think that to Mr. be honest with you, it, uh, we do the contracts according to the federal acquisition regulations. I don't think your mic is on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the mic wasn't on. But to be honest with you, Mr. Chairman, I can, uh, we construct the contracts on the basis of the federal acquisition regulations. In June of 2006, we uh, added to all of our contracts unilaterally the trafficking in persons clause uh, in conformance with legislation uh, by Congress. We take these very uh, seriously, but at this time our reach does not uh, extend to third country hiring practices. It's not within the terms of the contract, even though uh, you know, we can have a discussion about whether that's a good idea or not, it's currently not within the legislative scope of the, of the uh, federal acquisition regulations. Well, um, as the chairman said to me, we should uh, make sure that we have impact there. I would just conclude, and I, I think all my colleagues would agree, um, so I'm not just taking a, a position that's unique to my own view. Um, we are complicitous, uh, and we have to make sure this does not happen. We have to make sure that in the process of trying to find people who can work at the facility, given it can't be Iraqis, that we aren't, in essence, becoming part of the problem of human trafficking. And that's what I'm concerned about, at least as it relates to this hearing. And I know, Mr. Chairman, that was your concern when we started this. Well, that's, this is the reason for this hearing. I, you know, I, General Williams, I understand that the modification was made to the first Kuwaiti contract last year, amongst a lot of other contracts, because of legislation this Congress passed, sharing with everyone's concern on that. And they added the human trafficking clause. The president's made very clear that he declared uh, that there would be zero tolerance for it when it came to human trafficking. Uh, but even under General Casey's tenure in Iraq, the Department of Defense confirmed there were deceptive hiring practices going on at the time. Excessive fees charged by overseas job brokers who lure workers into Iraq, substandard living conditions once laborers arrive, violations of Iraqi immigration laws, lack of mandatory awareness training on the U.S. basis concerning human trafficking, and the general ordered in uh, April 2006 that harsh actions be taken against firms that failed to return passports or end other abusive practices. Contracts would be terminated, contractors would be blacklisted from future work, and commanders could physically bar firms from bases. We've put that modification there. Are you telling us now that that's not enough, uh, that in order to hold a Kuwaiti company, the Kuwaiti company responsible for their subcontracts who are out there bringing people in on these bad conditions or whatever, seems to me we need, A, 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 a more intensive authority for Mr. Krongrad to go in and inspect and audit, and two, we need to put some teeth into these things mm -hmm. uh, so that it doesn't happen. Uh, you, you know, like, and if, I'll just take the liberty of getting a response on that. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, we will clearly look into it. We take your counsel very seriously. Uh, this is a matter that uh, if we can have more authority and provisions, uh, I'm sure that our procurement uh, arm would be, would be delighted to deal with that. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, guess I think the testimony here today indicates, uh, Mr. Shays, I, I think you'll agree, right. inspections on a regular basis to see whether or not this is happening, contractual provisions to hold people responsible, not just to kick it down the road and say, gee, it happened in Asia or Southeast Asia. That's right. And then uh, some accountability on that. That's right. Sir, Thank if I could you. respond yes, to as well, because I, I, I agree with you. I wish I did have more authority, and that's why I went to the Justice Department. I've had lengthy discussions with them about what their jurisdiction is. But I do want to say you mentioned their subcontractors. We still do not have any evidence that First Kuwaiti is in privity with or has relationships with these contractors, uh, these uh, recruiters. In other words, the recruiters. I understand, but maybe we should find out whether or not that's the case. I've because done the I best think I could. it stretches the credibility of all of us here to think that every single worker for Kuwaiti just happened to be in Iraq at the time, right. whether they're from Nepal or India or someplace else, and they took them from somebody else's handiwork of getting them into Iraq. No, what happens is that the workers in these countries are recruited, they pay money to the recruiters and the recruiters assist them, just like college recruiters or something would do here, and assist them in getting the jobs with First Kuwaiti or with somebody else. People can't be turning a blind eye to that. People know how this process works, yes. and it shows up on their doorstep. People have to take responsibility for it one way or the other. Starts with us, goes down to the contractor, yes. goes right down to what's happening uh, to those people. When you have to take $2,500 from somebody in order to get them for a job that pays $7 a day, and then tell them they can't leave unless they pay $3,000, which is some of the testimony that we have in reports uh, and was before us today. There's a problem here. I don't think any of you disagree. I mean, we need to do something about that, and, and that's the purpose of this hearing uh, and this portion of this hearing. We take your counsel, Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Sure. McCollum, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to read a little more here. Uh, these workers reported that they usually raised money to pay for the recruiting fees by selling or mortgaging their land or house to a bank at 18 to 24 percent interest paid a year. Other workers borrowed money from family, friends, and their village to pay these legal fees to recruiters. And in several extreme cases, it went on that workers uh, relinquished all pay between nine and 12 months of labor in order to repay their recruiting fee and interest. But uh, on page two, uh, there's a uh, number four, I believe th this, this, these are your words, quote, I saw no evidence of trafficking and person violations other than illegal recruitment fees occurring. The workers were being paid, they had the ability to quit any time, and with some advance notice returned to their home country. Are those your words? No, uh, what you read from first were the words of the Inspector General of MNFI, which is appended to my report. So th th this is this is attached but, to your report. But I don't think I disagree with their conclusion that uh, those things which so were e excuse me though people who mortgaged their homes at 18 to 20 percent interest per year, borrowed money from family and friends, basically said that they relinquished all pay for nine to 12 months. You would agree then with the statement. At the bottom, workers were being paid and they had the ability to quit any time at some advance notice and return to their home country? Yes, they did have the right to do that. They had, and the, right, they had the right to do that probably if they came up with their own airfare to get back home and could find their passports. Well, I, have a, I have a question, sir. Mr. Owens and Mr. Mayberry described people who had been brought into work, in their opinion, under false pretenses. Do you think that they, uh, po uh, that, that uh, th there's some validity to their statements based on what I just read? And based on what you said about how this was subcontracted out to somebody, to somebody, to somebody, so nobody really knew what was going on when these people were recruited? No, I don't, I don't think that's what we're, that's not what I was told and that's not what I'm saying. Uh, first of all, the people that I spoke to, and, and I didn't speak I d to I, a I asked you if you thought Mr. Owens and Mr. Mayberry, based on what they testified, 
based on the, uh, based on the, the, the proximity, the, re the, the amount of time that they spent with these individuals being in an airplane when destination Baghdad came over, came over the speaker. I think most people around the world know where Baghdad is and what Baghdad translates in English. Um, seem pretty shocked and seem like they uh, didn't think that this is what they signed up for. Based on what I had just read and what, what has just been discussed by you gentlemen here for, um, in my opinion, horrific job recruiting practices, that this in fact, what Mr. Owens and what Mr. Mayberry said very well could have been accurate. You don't know that it isn't accurate, do you? Neither I nor the MNFI IG had found any reason to believe that the stories regarding the aircraft and people not knowing where they were going, were you we there? found nothing to support that. But, but, but you don't know whether it's accurate or inaccurate, do you? I have a lot of indication that it's not accurate. You have, All you the have, information I have, have other opinion. than from those two gentlemen is that uh, it's Major inaccurate. Major General Williams, we, you were talking about security earlier. Is the site of the U.S. Embassy construction area a secure area? Yes, it is. Does it access to the green zone and the embassy uh, construction site require a security clearance? Uh, that is set by the green zone. I defer to my colleague. Does the, the embassy construction site then, does that require security clearance? The access to the green zone is, is, is not, does not require a U.S. security clearance. Access to the construction site, as General Williams can explain better than I, there are multiple layers within the construction site. I have Some a limited, I, I understand that. My, it's, it's already yellow. Have security background checks been done on all the individuals permitted inside of the embassy construction zone? When they were required, I, uh, I've not received any information to suggest Are that all the employees at First Kuwaiti working on the site, do they all have security background checks? They have been vetted through the system that is required um, for all workers on our site. So these recruiters, when they were getting them in the villages and they were signing up their 18 and 20 percent mortgages on their homes so that they could pay these exorbitant recruiting fees, they were vetted by these recruiters? Uh, Congresswoman, I believe this was occurring in the countries where the individuals Whose were. Whose responsibility should it be for the security background checks? Should it be the U.S. government's responsibility? I defer to you. Ms. McCollum, there is the distinction between a U.S. security clearance, which is required and can only be granted to an American citizen to work in certain areas and to have either access to classified information. I'm to I, I, I made it very clear I was talking about construction sites, gentlemen. I'm I wasn't talking I'm about, you know, uh, you know, looking at how the alarm system's going uh, to operate. The, 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 the basic construction system, are these people, you, you said you couldn't hire Iraqis because they couldn't be vetted. So I'm asking, who vetted these people? Name checks are run on, on workers, but th there's a difference between vetting, mm -hmm. name check, mm -hmm. and a security clearance. And that's right. what I'm trying, trying to explain, is that there, there are, in effect, gradations and levels depending upon the work involved, ma'am. Well, Mr. Chair, my, my time's up, but I would be very interested in finding out why we weren't able uh, to uh, uh, really find, find out how these people were selected for this job. They came from countries, Pakistan, Egypt, Bangladesh, and India, where there is terrorism concerns, and the fact that, uh, that they are in country uh, working in a, in a U.S. area, building an embassy, is concerned to me. Mr. Kennedy, do if, you if, have I, a, if I might, Ms. McCollum, I, I know your time is limited today, but I would be happy to, to come and see you accompanied by a senior representative from our diplomatic security service to explain the intricate process that we do go through, ma'am. Mr. Kennedy, I think just providing that uh, information to the committee w would be fine. Thank you very much for your offer. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Ambassador, let me just provide a second on that because uh, I'm curious. Uh, there were two aspects to the, your issue with the people there. One was that Iraqis were finding it uh, difficult to go into the green zone and back out. They had their own security issue they were concerned about, and I understand that. That may, in fact, be a stopper on that. Uh, 
Uh, because my first question coming in here is why aren't we just hiring all Iraqis? If we can hire Pakistanis, we can, should be able to do the same background check on all of them. Is that pretty much it, that we could do the same background check on everybody and hire, but it's really the second point that's a stopper? It, it, there, it's both, sir. I mean, the, 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 a number of Iraqis are afraid to enter the green zone. Right. And secondly, we are, we are able to do the limited vetting that we do some, in some locations easier than we can do it in Iraq because of the, the, lack, of, the lack of records and the ongoing, the ongoing uh, strife there. So it may be easier in Nepal and Pakistan and places like that than it is in Iraq? To do, to do, to do vetting. Okay. Sir, could I make a point on that as well? Sure. Uh, some two years ago, I was before some of you, and, and in conjunction with the Inspector General of the Department of Defense, my office issued an interagency assessment of the Iraqi police training program. And one of the things we pointed out then, and I think it was well received, was that the recruits to the police forces were not vetted well. And there has always been difficulty for us as Americans in vetting Iraqis, particularly because you might find some terrorists in some of these other countries, but in Iraq, everyone has a side uh, they're, they have a religion, they have an ethnicity, they have a tribe, they're living in that war zone area. And we were critical at that time of the vetting process. And I personally continue to be concerned about anything that would bring large numbers of Iraqis who were not well vetted into secure areas. Thank you for that. Uh, and General, I have a point that I want to use. Michael Mishner from the, um, the human, um, the Department Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, DRL, I guess we, we call it or whatever, uh, I'm informed that he sought access to the embassy site in order to investigate allegations of labor abuse, and reportedly he was denied access by Mr. Golden, by James Golden. Uh, can you enlighten us on that? No, I cannot. Um, uh, I heard the same thing. I checked with uh, Mary French, who is the, uh, the keeper of the key to whoever comes on the guard side. She's very tight. She's very um, sensitive about um, what goes on on that site. Um, and Congressman, just understand that um, our people are under tremendous pressure. Uh, and I know you have appreciation what a war zone is, but um, it is wound up as tight as it can get every day. And there's so much that Mary has to look at. One is security. We were concerned about this from day one. Can I, can I just and interrupt you for a second because I want to make sure we get your answer right to that. Yeah. I, I'm not told that she refused anybody yeah. uh, admission. I'm told that Mr. Golden, uh, without comment, re refused Mr. Missioner uh, the access. I, now, I Mr. Do. Golden himself isn't even on the site, so. Right. So I don't, I don't know. Would that you inquire into that for us and get and back I'll to the committee as to what to you on is that, going sir. on that? Because I yes, think sir. that's important to know. Yes. Uh, I'm sh I assume, and you can tell me otherwise, that you've never resisted uh, the initiation of investigation by an inspector general or by the Department of Justice or any other investigative body, even the DRL. Is that correct? No, but uh, when issues come to me uh, in that regard, I uh, report them to the inspector general and the department in the State Department that's responsible for them. Yeah, I, I'll tell you one more thing, that reason why that concerns me. I have a series of emails here that went from the DRL uh, back and forth to Baghdad on that, and the, the last one is from Mr. Golden, mm. all right, and basically is to uh, Mary French, you mentioned, and refers to an email about this traffic in question, whether or not uh, we can inquire into those matters or not, uh, and Mr. Golden res responds to Mary French, do not respond to these folks, mm. it's the DRL. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I would be concerned about that. I hope you'll look into that. Well, I will look you know, into it. Uh, uh, on that because I think it's their yeah. job to inquire. Sure. I think sure. we I want them to do that, and I suspect you want them to do it. That's right. Last, last point for me before Mr. Chase adds his last one, we let you go. Uh, and I don't know if Mr. Kennedy or who is it like this. Um, I understand we're building uh, or plan to build an embassy in Lebanon, and there's been controversy reported recently right. uh, that it's right smack in the area where uh, Hezbollah is said to control. Um, I'm told recently that that might now be on hold. You know, is it on hold or is it going forward? If it's on hold, exactly when was that decision made and communicated to you? Um, this is part of our ongoing process. The general working with the entire department prepares a, a list, and we will build this embassy next and then that embassy. We had plans to build an embassy in Beirut. 
uh, in light of the recent events in Lebanon, there was a discussion within the department, and on the 6th of July, the, uh, the Undersecretary for Management determined that the conditions on the ground in Beirut did not permit us now to proceed with the construction right. uh, effort. That was communicated the following day to uh, the, the yeah. general, right. to the Near East Bureau, and okay. to our ambassador in Lebanon. And we're all aware that it was the embassy in Lebanon going back and forth. There seemed to be some discussion, at least on the wire, that the, amb uh, the ambassador and people in Lebanon were anxious that it not happen. There was some pushback from general, I guess, from you or, uh, and, or maybe Mr. Golden or others. Well, and this went back and forth until there was a decision made. Is there that was not that There's a discussion right. about right. about what is yeah. best to do. We we seek right. the advice of right. the ambassador, and the ambassador made right. his recommendation, Clearly. and the undersecretary right. determined that the conditions mm -hmm. on the ground did not permit us to build that embassy at this time. And that was then communicated right. to all within the department and to our ambassador in Beirut. And it was a very orderly process, Mr. Chairman, uh, of give and take. Uh, so uh, we arrived at a decision, and it's fine. Okay. And so as of July 6, it's on hold. Right. Yes, sir. And you'll inform Congress as, as you move forward if, if there's correct. any change yes, in that. Last question from me. Uh, I'd like your reaction to a statement uh, that the embassy in Iraq is bigger than it should be if you really expect Iraq to stabilize and not as big as it needs to be, the nerve center of an ongoing war effort. Well, let me speak to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, because we took great care uh, before the appropriation committees and the authorizers before we move forward. All of the plans for the execution of this project was presented to them. One of the issues that were on the table was scalability. What happens if we go down? What happens if we expand? So we, if you look at our site, you know it's sort of rectangular in shape. So we spread it out over the 65 acres to allow us the, the uh, opportunity to jettison, uh, cut off, sell off, give away whatever we were going to do uh, with any one of the facilities. And we left the nerve center in the center of this footprint. Hence so we could get as small center. as we yeah. needed to get, and we could jettison off the rest. Our appropriators thought, th thought this was a good way to do it. So we can expand or we can uh, shrink. Good. Thank you for that. Mr. Shays, you indicated you had a further question. Just, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to thank our, our witnesses. I want to thank them for their work. I want to thank them for their dedication. Uh, and, and to suggest that I, I also appreciate your candor in the area that we do need to address, and that is uh, the hiring practice of, of third parties. And, uh, and, and that's something that, we one, we need to empower the Inspector General to have a little bit more oversight there, and we need to make sure that we're not washing our hands of it because it's a third party, and I think you all agree. Yeah. Uh, and that's the element of this hearing that I thought had merit. I will say the other aspects of it, I think, uh, didn't. But this is the area that did, in my judgment. Thank and you. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, because I know that's what thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chase. That's exactly uh, let me, let what. Let this me make this point. Yeah. I know this was the intent of this subcommittee's hearing. It exactly was, and I, and I thank you for that, uh, gentlemen. I, I think that there's only two things outstanding. One is is a document request, and another is a subpoena. Uh, and I would just like to get a date. And I think Mr. Williams, was, uh, Ambassador Kennedy, and Mr. Krongard are. Uh, the ones who are going to be responding to that, if you could just give me a date as to when we can expect uh, that we, material. We did get a, a, a number of materials to you today. Right. There is a, there's a cover letter, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, our legislative people are in contact with you. There are a couple of documents that you've requested that we simply have not been able to identify right. a document that directly equates to your request. But we have no intention of, of, of hiding anything from you. That, no that claims of executive privilege or anything else? Uh, no. Not okay. that I'm aware of. Yes, yeah. Sir, if Mr. I may, we, we did uh, resp I, I still to this moment haven't seen the subpoena, but when it was told to me yesterday, um, I spoke to the people who responded to you, and there were two things that were put in a letter, I think, that came to you this morning. Uh, one is that I can tell you that I have no, nothing of any significance that hasn't been incorporated or referred to in my report. But there are things which uh, do exist, and I am very concerned that to give up ma investigative materials like this to um, requests such as this at this time would be very, um, have a very chilling effect on my ability to carry out my statutory responsibilities. Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to do you a favor then. I'm going to have our committee work with you to see if we Thank get you. beyond that before we 
uh, do anything formal on that. Uh, and if that proves to be the case, then certainly we'll respect that. If it doesn't, we'll talk with the minority and, and we'll come back and, uh, and discuss with you how we might get what we need without jeopardizing your responsibility. And you understand, that. sir, that there's a distinction between the department responding and the department of IG do. responding. I certainly do. Uh, Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, let me thank you. Uh, this, I mean, this panel gets to the nub of the issue on the third country nationals and an issue that I don't think has been a priority uh, ever. Uh, it's been a unique problem and I appreciate your candor on this and I appreciate the chairman's calling our attention to it. As far as the other elements of the hearing, I think we could have gotten right to this and got right to the nub of it and I thought the other was kind of frankly a little wasteful. But Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you bringing this to our attention and I appreciate the job you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank all of you again. Thank you. Thank you.